So, we are just in time for a Starliner conference. Are you ready to Starliner? I'm ready. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go? Your stream is behind. I, I don't... Okay. NASA, Boeing, and ULA team. All right, fine. We'll start at the beginning then. Discovery, go at throttle up. I'm ready. I'm in the mighty USA now. Hey, 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 hey. alleviate. I'm glad the trip, glad the move went okay, dude. That's awesome. Um, to, to... to start, we will hear from NASA All right. Associate Administrator Jim Free. All right, Jimmy, what do you got? Thanks, Stephanie, and good morning. Thanks for uh, for joining us here today. Um, you know, our NASA UI. Yeah, no, I hear you, man. I'm glad you spent the, glad the move went good. Couple weeks on analysis and testing for that. But we're already we're already a little bit behind, so I'll just pause it. I'm happy I'm happy you I'm happy you're here in one piece, dude. It's good good to have you on board, my friend. Good to have you on board. Welcome to the freaking party. Soy el fiesta. <clears throat> anyway. That's cool, man. I'm glad glad you and yours got here okay in one piece. And you set up. That's awesome. Should be good. As the late, well, not late, as the great Jeremy Clarkson once said, Welcome to freedom. You'll like it here. Yep. Yep. Just flip that one around. That was an obscure Top Gear episode reference, but hey, whatever. Whatever. It's fine. Anyway, so we have a we have an update to the crew flight test. We're going to figure out, uh, get some uh, transparency here about what's going on with Starliner and why it was moved to June 1st. So, in true interview style, when we listen, uh, sometimes listening is more important than talking. So, I am shutting up, and I'm going to listen to what these fine folks have to say here. Good to see you live after I just come out of an exam. Well, Mac, Matt, we are, you are just in time for a media teleconference. Oh, it's going to be great. Today is Friday in California. All right, EJ shutting up time. Let's go. Atlas V and, and Boeing Starliner to prepare for that first crewed flight test um, to, to ISS. Um, most importantly, I want to thank all three of those teams who've been working those issues, um, doing the analysis, thinking through all the scenarios, talking through things as a group, uh, sharing information to make sure that everybody had the latest uh, technical information so that they could make the decisions and feed things up to the managers, which you'll hear from today. Um, and we are learning more about the systems every day. I also want to acknowledge to you all that, you know, we've had our effort focused on addressing these technical challenges, getting to the right solutions. Um, each one of the technical issues that you hear, hear about today, we're, we're moving pretty quick and, and learning and kind of one flowing into the other, which we wanted to get all that information together to inform you and find the right time uh, to, to do that, and that, that date is today. Uh -huh. And I know there's some frustration out there about uh, us sharing information in a timely way. I can assure you that the teams were working up until late yesterday coming to a conclusion. So we, we wanted to make sure that we, we had everything in line and in place for you, and you'll hear about that today from uh, Steve and Mark and Gary. Um, we do hear your concerns and comments about the flow of information, and, uh, and, and that's my rationale. I'm happy to answer your questions about the rationale, but, uh, but, but please know that uh, getting this to you and getting the complete story has been our goal. You are an important part of telling our commercial crew story and, and we'll continue to adjust our approach as we find the right balance of providing those updates as we learn more information uh, going forward. So this morning we're uh, gonna hopefully remedy uh, that. I, you will get a lot of information from, from Sox and from Steve and, and Mark and Gary to share with you where we stand and what we see as a possible path moving forward. I'll, I'll let them share those details um, as they have been very much uh, in the, uh, I guess, in the working meetings to, to solve all these, and, and I can assure you they have been there. Um, I appreciate everyone that's been involved, every individual working tirelessly to advance our understanding 
of this system as we move through each of these issues. It's our collective job to ensure we can fly this test flight safely and successfully, and to do that, we're going to understand everything about these issues and make the right decisions. That's why we're taking our time. We need to be deliberate about it. This is a new spacecraft and a new system. We've all challenged the teams to stay vigilant, and we've already you know, uncovered some of the unknowns, unknowns that you always hear about when we talk about flight, flight tests, and it's better that we've done that on the ground. We're going to keep learning from this mission, and I'm looking forward to increasing the knowledge of this system and flying with crew in this system as we, as we get to ISS. This is all working towards giving us that dissimilar redundancy that's an important goal of the commercial crew program and essential to our continued decade of results aboard the International Space Station. Um, it's preparing us every day for the missions to low Earth orbit. That'll open access to space to more people and is informing, greatly informing, our human exploration to the moon and beyond. With that, let me turn it over to, uh, to Ken Bowersox. Go ahead, Sox. Hey, thanks, Jim, and thanks, everybody hey. uh, who's online for being here with us today. Um, we really appreciate your interest in what we're doing. Um, yesterday, I had the opportunity to sit with representatives from NASA, Boeing, ULA, and Aerojet uh, in a program board. I was only there for a, for a small part of the meeting. But for the time I was there, it was just impressive to see the team working so thoroughly, uh, so collaboratively through a very, very complicated issue. Um, one of the things that popped out to me was this is why it's taken a while for us to be ready to discuss the issue. Um, it's so complicated. There's so many things going on. Um, we really just needed to, to work through it as a team. And it was impressive to see folks in that process as they converged and, and reached a, a plan for us to move towards launch. Um, so thank you for your patience as, as we've uh, worked through that. I know you're eager to hear more details, and so now I'll pass over to Steve to share some of those details. Yeah, th thank you, Ken, and, and thanks to all of you for being here today uh, uh, on the Friday before a long Memorial Day weekend. Appreciate your interest in human space flight and the commercial crew program, and I want to thank you for your patience. I am interested as our joint NASA, Boeing, and ULA team work through uh, three specific issues over the last two and a half weeks. Uh, our goal today is to provide a comprehensive update to you on what we've been working on, uh, what the resolution of each of these items are, and then to take uh, take questions that you might have. I would say um, I want to kind of set the stage for what it's been like uh, for our team over the last two and a half weeks. As you know, in Commercial Crew, we have a small focus team, and we've been working very hard. You'll get a sense of that work today, minus the long hours and, and probably lots of coffee. So um, if we step back, we last talked to you uh, after the launch scrub on May 6th. That was the scrub for the Centaur self-regulating valve, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we really, I want to talk three aspects of the work we've been doing uh, over this time frame, the swap out of that Centaur self-regulating valve and the checkout and, and how complex that activity was, a helium leak that we discovered in one of the doghouse manifolds on the service module for Starliner, and then I would say the implications uh, for that leak and uh, what it meant to the rest of the propulsion system uh, relative to uh, the deorbit burn. So let's start with the Centaur valve. Uh, that was the first thing that we worked on, and that was the, what caused the initial scrub. Uh, after the scrub, we got together and That's we looked the at house. the data for that uh, Centaur self-regulating valve. We determined that the number of cycles that it saw was outside of qualification. When I say we, this was a joint uh, NASA and ULA team working side by side. So that valve had exceeded the number of cycles that we saw in qualification, so we couldn't go fly that valve. We obviously rolled back from, from the launch pad to the vertical uh, integration facility, and we swapped that valve out, and Gary will talk a little bit more about that. Gary? Um, we looked at all the data for the new valve, its performance. Um, we went and looked at what we call the acceptance test packs. We didn't see any issues, non-conformances with that valve, and so we proceeded with that swap out. 
Now, that swap out was a pretty uh, substantial activity, and that's why we adjusted the launch date uh, from the May 10th to the 17th. And let me explain why that was a complicated activity. When the valve has to swap out, of course, the, the Centaur is an awesome stage. We've been flying it since the 1960s, but it's a pressure stabilized stage. And so, in order to swap this valve, the Centaur LOX tank and fuel tank had to be depressurized. In order for that to happen, we had to uh, offload the weight on, that cent on the Centaur, essentially. And so we used a crane to lift the Starliner, not off of the Centaur, but to pull up on the Centaur Rich. and to take the load off of that, off the Centaur um, stage. In order to do that, we had to go back and do an analysis of all the load paths. And just to make sure, Starliner is certified to be lifted with a crane. That's certainly the way... It's moved for weight in CG uh, in the processing facility that Boeing has. It's also the way it's stacked and assembled on, on the launch vehicle. Yep. But we, didn't, we weren't unbolting at this time, so we were applying a little bit more loads to the same load path we used to lift it. We had to go through that analysis, working with the joint Boeing ULA NASA team. We did that. We did that operation uh, over the weekend of May 11th and 12th and replaced the valve, and, and Gary will talk more about that. So we got through that. In the meantime, so that's the Centaur self-regulating valve. When we had the launch scrub on May 6th, we discovered in one of the helium, what we do after that launch scrub is we sort of safe the propulsion system. And part of that safing is to close what we call helium manifold valves. In each of the dog houses, those are the rectangular dog houses. There's, there's four of them, port, starboard, top, and bottom on the service module. There's a helium line that goes into each of those doghouses. There's actually two manifold, two helium manifolds in each of the doghouses. Those are used to open and close uh, valves on each of the thrusters, the RCS thrusters and the OMAC thrusters. When we closed that system after the launch scrub, we saw a small leak in starboard, uh, I'm sorry, in the port manifold two doghouse when we closed the isolation valves. It was a very small leak at the time. It was about um, 7 PSI per minute, and that may sound like a big leak, but, again, this is a really small volume. It's about 15 cubic inches of volume, and so when we close Nothing. that valve, it doesn't take long to see a leak in a very tiny vo uh, volume. That, that size is about the size of a softball, if you just think about that, 15 cubic inches. So we saw that leak uh, at the pad. Uh, we rolled the vehicle back to the vertical assembly facility, and we wanted to troubleshoot that leak a little bit more. And so we, we cycled that manifold open to bring it up to the, the flight pressure, which is about 750 pounds per square inch. And over a couple different cycles, we saw that leak rate grow. It went from about 7 to on the order of 50 to 70 PSI per minute. So that gave us pause as that leak um, that leak rate grew, and we wanted to understand what was causing that leak. In order to do that, we took off the cover on the port doghouse, and the Boeing team uh, took a leak detector and looked all across that particular doghouse for leaks. It's a device that measures the helium that could come out of any point in the line. When we did that, we were able to isolate the leak to one of the what we call a flange on a thruster that's called the P2D2 RCS thruster. This flange is about the size of a, a, a card, a deck, of, a deck of cards, so it's a pretty small flange. But in that flange, there is a helium line that comes in, a um, MMH line, the fuel, and then uh, NTO line, nitrogen tetroxide line, that comes into that flange into the thruster. So we couldn't immediately open up that flange to uh, look at what was going on and what was causing this leak in the helium system. Okay. So we had to do um, an analysis-based approach to go understand why we had this helium leak. We knew the leak was there, and we knew the size of the leak, and we actually knew in this flange which side the, the helium was coming out of, but we couldn't open it up because essentially the system was not safe for humans to be around and open that system up. Yep. It's fueled. Don't, so you don't want to do that. So in addition to the cycle testing that we did, and we also looked at all the other manifolds. So there's eight total helium manifolds. Only one has showed the leak, and that's this port uh, this doghouse, helium manifold two. So when we went through the 
20 minutes shooting that's for it. this, we figured out that the others are not leaking at all, but we wanted to understand what was the potential cause of this. And so we went and worked with a team to look at potential failure modes within that flange. We figured the most likely cause of the leak is a seal that seals that flange. In between the two metal parts of the flange, there's a seal, much like you would have on any piece of your plumbing at home, a faucet or anything like that. There's a seal that keeps that interface tight so that the helium can pass through there. We had to do special analysis on the seal. We brought in seal experts from Boeing and, uh, and NASA to look at that seal, to look at why it could be leaking. We figured out that this potential seal could have a potential no defect in it, and over time as we cycled it, that defect grew a little bit, and then that, w that was the cause of the leak. We also did a structural analysis of that helium flange to look at when you have a seal, you want to make sure that seal is, is in the groove, if you will, and you want to look at the sealing force uh, in that particular, um, in the groove. And That's we had just a, a finite pneumatic. element analysis well. done, a very detailed structural analysis to look at that it looks something like on that. The seal. We felt like we had a really good um, seal there on all the other manifolds, and that's why we are confident in, in this case, there's 28 RCS thrusters across the vehicle, and 27 of those do not have a leak, and the one has a leak. We looked at also, with that leak rate, what if it gets worse? So how do we manage it on flight, in flight if that leak rate in this uh, port doghouse helium manifold 2 got worse? We can accommodate leaks in multiple manifolds. Should that happen, should we be wrong about something, we could handle up to four more leaks, and we could handle this particular leak if that leak rate were to grow even up to 100 times in this one doghouse. So, again, we needed to take the time to work through this analysis and to understand the helium leak and understand the ramifications of that, and that's why it's taken a little while to get back to you. Pretty much, Elvis. Now, sounds like somebody to over uh, it. As we studied the helium leak, we also looked across the rest of the propulsion system and just to make sure we didn't have any other uh, things that we should be concerned about. We found a design vulnerability, I would say, um, in the prop system as we analyzed this particular helium leak to where uh, we didn't, for certain failure cases that are very remote, we didn't have the capability to execute the deorbit burn with redundancy. And what I mean by that is Starliner is certified to perform the deorbit burn with three different techniques. We can use four OMAC thrusters, two OMAC thrusters, and eight RCS jets. If we had the right circumstances of failures, we could lose uh, the eight RCS jets. And so we wanted to take extra precaution to understand what could we do if we lost those four thrusters. We worked with uh, the vendor of the thruster, Boeing, and our NASA team to come up with a, a redundant method to do the deorbit burn, to break it up into two burns, uh, about 10 minutes each, uh, 80 minutes apart, to come up with a four RCS thruster deorbit burn, and to, to regain the capability of the original system. And that took a little time for our team to go work through. Our guidance navigation control team, our structures team, our propulsion team, working hand-in-hand -hand with Boeing uh, and the vendors for these systems. And so we have that, we store that redundancy for the backup capability in a very remote set of failures for the deorbit burn. So it took a little bit of a while to work through that. Because we had that particular uh, system uh, vulnerability, we decided to have a Delta uh, flight readiness review, and that is primarily because some of the human rating certification details have changed from what everybody who signed the interim human certification document for CFT has changed. And so we're going to have a Delta flight readiness review on May the 29th to review uh, the, both the leak and the changes to, um, to the, the way we would execute a deorbit burn in a remote set of failures. Long-term, long Boeing is going to explore options uh, as they work towards certification after the crude flight test to uh, recover this redundancy. Uh, they are evaluating potential software uh, fixes or other, other changes that we, we could have to restore that capability. Uh, I have spoken to the crew several times. We've stayed in contact with them. They've been a part of our meetings. Um, their job, as they know, is be ready to fly. They've been in quarantine now for a little over a month. They're in good spirits. They've tied into our meetings. 
Uh, they advised us to get some rest, which we're going to do now that we've set up for the launch on June 1st with the Memorial Day weekend, having our team who's worked very hard for two and a half weeks to have a little bit of downtime. Um, she says that the, and the crew has also been in the simulator uh, looking at various failure cases, some of them very extreme, should we lose uh, various thrusters and various manifolds. And they have flown all those cases in terms of rendezvous and, and deorbit and entry, and, and they're ready to go. Um, Butch, when we talked to him, he said, you know, we're in the business of discovery. We've obviously had some discovery over the last few weeks. Um, he knew going into the flight we would have some discovery, and we've had it prior to launch versus in flight. And Butch says that, that they're ready to go and when we're ready to go. So what's next for us? Um, we had a program control board yesterday where we went through the, the two topics in detail, uh, that being the helium leak and the uh, port manifold two, and then the implications for the redundancy for the deer burn. Uh, we feel like we're on a good path. We have a few actions to close. We'll uh, follow that up next week with a Delta program control board, and then we'll have the Delta agency flight te test readiness review next Wednesday. Um, and then uh, the following day, uh, if that review gives us a go to proceed, we'll roll the Atlas V and Starliner out to the pad, and we'll have the uh, Starliner mission management team the next Discovery. day. Go at throttle up. And then we'll come back and talk to you again um, next week uh, after the review. And, and let you know the latest status, and we've already talked about the launch dates. Um, you know, this is an important flight for us. Uh, it is not easy. I've been in human space flight for 37 years, and there's challenges with every single flight. Um, there were challenges in space shuttle. There's challenges with the Orion vehicle that we're learning about as we flew that test flight, and uh, there's challenges in every vehicle. So we'll work through those, More or less AP. those challenges one by one. We're about I'm extremely five proud of the behind. teams. They put in long hours, worked over the weekend. Um, the, the joint NASA, U, um, Boeing, ULA teams working through this integrated set of problems. We're really looking forward to having the second crew transportation system online soon and when we're ready to go, and so we can continue to do the great research on ISS. Um, this is why we do a test flight. There's always learning in every flight that we fly, whether it's a test flight or another flight. I'm super proud of the team, and uh, Gary and Mark will add some more details. And with that, I'll turn it over to Daniel Michael. Thanks, Dean. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I really want to extend my thanks and appreciation to the commercial crew program, the Boeing, and our technical teams for the extensive analysis and work that they've done these past couple weeks to get us to this point. They really worked diligently to understand this helium leak and the implications associated with the, the fault tolerance and to make sure we can fly safely. These are some incredible teams, and I'm really grateful for the long hours they put in to get us to this point. From a station standpoint, um, we, of course, have followed along with all of the work. Our responsibility is really for the integrated operations risk realm, meaning for safe rendezvous, docking, the vehicle being on board station, and then undocking. And so kind of the, the sphere, if you will, um, around ISS. So we've worked through uh, all of these challenges as well. We're really happy with the plan. We think we're in great shape to support integrated operations from a station standpoint. Of course, in the, in the coming days, as Steve said, we'll have another uh, flight test readiness review where we'll get the broader community to do another pass through and look at, at all of the great work that the team has done. Um, this is a really critical and historic mission for NASA, Boeing, and of course the, the space station program, as Steve mentioned, to get a second U.S. crewed vehicle capability up and flying to space station. Um, we're going to take our time to get there. We're going to make sure that we, we do it right and that we do it safely. Um, in other space station news, we continue to be really busy on board. The crew has been working on research. They've done a number of equipment replacements for us, and they're starting to step into some of the EDA preparations work in support of the upcoming spacewalks that we have in June. Next week on Tuesday, May 28th, we have a Progress Undocking. That's Progress 86. And then we've got Progress 88 launching on May 30th at about 5.45 a.m. Eastern time. It's launching from Kazakhstan. It will be carrying thousands of pounds of supplies. Very it's nice. It's docking to station on June 1st around 7.45 a.m. Eastern time. So as always, a lot of things going on on board Space Station, but we are ready to support Starliner 
Butch and Sonny when they arrive, and we are very much looking forward to supporting this historic mission. And with that, I'll pass it over to Mark Nappy. Good morning, and thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. Uh, Steve talked a lot about the, the leak and the uh, what we call fault tolerance issue. Uh, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what he said, but not to just repeat it and, and say it again, but to, more, to add more context on how we address these issues and how thorough the whole process was. Um, like Steve said, it's completely partnered. Uh, we utilize skills and experts from across NASA, Boeing, and our suppliers to, to get to the right answers and build flight rationale. Uh, you know, timeline of where we got to, we, we scrubbed on 5-6, rolled back, ULA went first and, and worked on the valve, and then we got right in there and started looking in at the, uh, the leak that was discovered on the, on the scrub operation. Uh, by 5-13, we had located the leak. We had checked all the potential sources. There were uh, over 30 different sources that the team had identified. And then we went back a couple days later, and we proved to ourselves that the leak was stable. Uh, that's all good data, uh, but that really starts the process of, okay, where, how do we solve this? How do we get flight rationale? How do we determine what we're going to do next? So there were a couple of questions that we had to answer. First, why wasn't the seal uh, in this joint ceiling? You know, exactly why. Uh, will it get worse? How much worse can it get? Does the condition uh, or uh, can the condition exist in the other flanges? Is there some kind of common cause? And then if we were to accept this, would it be operationally manageable in flight? And can we tolerate it or are there workarounds? So that really is what took a lot of time for us to, to go resolve was answering all these questions. And of course, during answering these questions, uh, we, we found that design vulnerability that Steve talked about. Um, he said it was remote, and I'll point out that it is, it, it is very remote. Uh, when we looked at the fault tolerance of the system, there were over 17,000 potential combinations of failures, and uh, what we found was that 99.2% of them were all addressed, and this small 0.77% uh, uh, is what we found. So uh, that puts into context the remoteness. Um, to address these issues, like Steve said, we just covered the, the landscape with all these modeling experts and suppliers and system experts, designers, and then even did independent verifications uh, of the results once we got them. Uh, we met nearly every day, either in some kind of mission management team or a control board, to hear status, to hear results, and to get everybody installments of what we have learned each day. Uh, the teams you know, went under some pretty immense scrutiny uh, to be able to explain the, the issues that we were finding. Uh, they got pressure tested on their conclusions, and then, you know, eventually we got a, the community bought into our flight rationale and the actions. So bottom line, you know, Ken said that uh, this is, these are complicated issues, and, and they are, uh, but it boils down to a couple of things. On the leak, uh, the design meets the intent for this application. So it's not a design problem. Uh, we don't believe we have a common cause where this condition exists across all the other flanges, which is good news. And we are comfortable with the, the causes that we've identified for this specific leak location. And if the steel completely blows out and we had just metal to metal contact, we know we can manage this. So this is really not a safety of flight issue for ourselves and we believe that we have a, a a well understood condition that we can manage. For the fault tolerance, or as Steve called it, the design vulnerability, um, again, extremely unlikely set of multiple failures that would have to occur for us to get into this situation. Um, and if it happened before we undocked, uh, we wouldn't undock. So we, you know, we would manage it uh, and be able to address it there. If it, it was to happen after we undock from station, uh, again, extremely unlikely. But we have now a solution uh, with this four RCF jet uh, scenario that Steve walked through. Uh, it's backed by test data. It's backed by flight data. And the guidance and navigation modeling have reinforced uh, that this, this technique will work. 
and, we, and of course, we've had independent verification on that. The crew has tested it, and we feel very comfortable with the situation that we have. So again, very low level of risk for an unlikely set of failure scenarios, and we have a safe uh, for flight vehicle uh, to uh, that we need to put just the final set of flight rationale together in the coming days, and, and we'll be ready for these sets of meetings that we have in front of us. Uh, the minimal work left in order to get to uh, launch next uh, next Saturday. Uh, we have some, you know, of course, a lot of meetings to go through with control boards and the Delta FFR, FR that Steve talked about in the L minus one and L minus two day. Uh, we chose 6-1 for a multitude of reasons, but one of the big reasons was to give the workforce the, the weekend off. We had a, uh, we've worked some really long hours, uh, seven days a week to get to where we are today. And we just thought it was a good idea to take a break this weekend, reset everybody's batteries, and then uh, gear up for a launch next Saturday. Uh, remember, this is a test flight. Um, we're still learning. We will we'll continue to learn. We really like to thank NASA, ULA, and our suppliers on how they came together with our Boeing team to, uh, to execute uh, this mission and to get to next Saturday. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Gary. Thanks, Mark. First, I want to thank all of you for participating today and your, your interest. Um, I speak for the entire ULA team that we're really excited um, as we progress to the, the next opportunity to fly the crewed flight test. Um, like Mark and, and Steve have talked, we've spent uh, the last two weeks working integrated collaboratively together between Boeing, ULA, NASA, and, and suppliers on both sides. Uh, working through the issues and uh, preparing the hardware for flight. Steve walked you through a, a pretty extensive explanation of, of the process that we went through to replace the self-regulating vent valve. Um, you know, structurally, we had to relieve the load off the Centaur uh, when we got back to the VIF. So we attached that GSC to Starliner and uh, applied... Uh, that force, uh, which we refer to as, as putting the Centaur stage in stretch. So it transitions from uh, pressure stabilized to structurally stabilized with that assist. Uh, that enabled us to depressurize the tanks um, and get in to access the valve and, and make that replacement. So the team replaced that valve, then subsequently repressurized the stage uh, and conducted functional checkouts of the valve assembly and uh, did some system purges to make sure everything was, was operating as it should and then uh, put the, the, the rocket back into a configuration that would support continued processing. So um, after the scrub on May 6th, that took us to around May 13th to get all that work completed. Um, to be able to proceed, and, and then we worked, you know, from an integrated perspective since Starliner's on top of the rocket uh, with the Boeing team to make sure that they had all the support they needed to to look into the uh, the helium leak in, in the VIF. Um, the rocket remains stacked there in the VIF and poised ready to support as soon as uh, the NASA, Boeing, and ULA team uh, are ready to go to flight. Just forecasting going forward on the activities, we will likely spend Tuesday and Wednesday of next week performing continued closeouts of the vehicle. Um, in parallel, we'll do the flight test readiness review with the NASA Boeing team. And then subsequent to that, we would plan to roll on Thursday of next week. Friday, because of the launch time being earlier in the day, uh, we'll have a crew sync day, get the team realigned for, for a launch attempt on Saturday. And so look forward to any questions. Appreciate your interest. Thanks. Stephanie, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for all those opening remarks Ready for from the fun our part? Uh, speakers and the Here detail the that you part. shared with us. Uh, we'll now address your questions. We do have quite a few people on the line. And I know you all are eager to ask questions, so please do remember to identify to whom you are addressing your question 
and please, please do stick to one question so that everybody gets an opportunity to ask their question. All right, let's see how long um, the one question if you format you need lasts. a reminder, uh, you can press star one to get into the queue. If your question was asked, you can remove yourself by pressing star two. So let's jump right in with Bill Harwood from CBS News, please. Hi, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. It's Bill Harwood, CBS. I think this is for Steve. I didn't, I'm not sure I understand the loss of redundancy issue for entry. I mean, is, that's something obviously you discovered, I'll say, out of the blue um, while you were investigating, you know, across the propulsion system. But I don't understand what gets you into that situation um, and, and why. Well, I just don't understand it. So maybe if you could provide a little bit more detail, I'd appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, Bill, that's a good good question. It, it's, uh, good question. It's, it's complicated. Um, it probably is not so much for entry, I would say, but it's really for execution of the deorbit burn. So the the cases that we would worry about here would be um, a case where you would lose uh, two manifolds in um, what I would call adjacent doghouses. So in other words, it needs to be the port doghouse that you would lose. And this is really uh, a little bit independent of the leak, per se. So if you lost a, the right manifold in port doghouse and let's say the top doghouse, the way the software works for the orbit is when you lose for the OMAX, for example, they're big thrusters. They are about 1,500 pounds of thrust. And so um, in the four OMAX version of the orbit, you would have one thruster firing in each doghouse, um, one OMAX thruster in the two uh, OMAC case, you, you can have them firing in, I would say, uh, doghouses that are across from each other. But if you would, were to lose two adjacent doghouses, essentially it takes out any OMAC deorbit capability and uh, you don't have the eight RCS thrusters. And so that's the case we would have to download to the four thrusters. So it's a pretty diabolical case where you would lose two helium manifolds in two separate doghouses, and they have to be next to each other around the clock, right? If you, if you think about these doghouses going around the clock on the Starliner uh, service module, you'd have to, they'd have to be uh, total loss of the manifold and um, uh, right adjacent to each other. And so that's why, as Mark said, this is a pretty remote set of failures. And so... We, uh, we figured that out, and we have a, a backup way to do the deal with burn with four thrusters, uh, breaking the burn up into two, and it's a, pretty, it's a pretty deep failure case. This vehicle has lots of thruster redundancy. Yeah, that's okay, thanks super, for that explanation, super unlikely to happen. Our next question comes from Jeff Faust of Space News. Hey, good morning. Uh, question for Mark. Um, if you're not able for any reason to go on June 1st or any of the other dates in early June, how, long, how much longer can you remain stacked on top of the uh, Atlas V before you would have to uh, de-stack to address uh, any sort of propellant issues or anything else like limiting on the spacecraft that would need to be refreshed? Thanks. No, it's smaller. Yeah, we've, um, we've looked at that, and we, Starliner is really not the, uh, the governing Factor here, it really is the launch vehicle. Solid rocket uh, boosters. Gary to address, you know, where we would go at, if we miss these opportunities. Yeah, Jeff, that's a that's a good question. As as you guys know, there's there's a series of things that we refer to as limited life. We have batteries. Um, primarily, we have a large number of tests that we have to conduct on a regular basis uh, within the ordnance system focused on uh, uh, FTS, safe and arm functions, and other pyro valve cartridges, things like that, that, uh, yeah. that we would have to repeat tests on. And so those um, expire, I will say, um, throughout June and into July. And so uh, from a limited life perspective, we would work through those items, do those retests, and uh, swap out the hardware that, that's needed to be able to continue to support in parallel, we'd have to work with our other customers for the manifest for the rest of the year to make sure that we can deconflict, and uh, some of it will come down to a prioritization of, of missions throughout the rest of the year. And so we would be looking for uh, 
our NASA and, and primarily Space Force customers uh, to work with us to identify those priorities and, and to sequence the mission. So um, that yeah. would be forward work. Um, yeah, I was wrong. It's not so much the solids. It's it's the, uh, I mean, the, the SRBs are just derived from ICBMs. So yeah, there's designed to sit in a silo. So uh, I guess that solid rocket thing applies for uh, two segmented SRBs, not cased SRBs. But he was talking about pyro valves. Pyro valves, in case anybody's wondering, is it's a valve. So it could be for fluid, could be for pneumatics, could be for whatever. Pyro valves are basically um, a one use, a one time use valve. It's basically a shotgun shell attached to a pipe, right? It's not a shotgun shell exactly. It's a it's a it's a pyro. It's a little little explosive. And basically, what it's designed to do, it's a one time use valve. Pyro valves are only used once. And once the pyro valve is triggered, that valve never open, never closes again. It's a one-time, it's a one-way valve. Uh, one-way valves are used uh, in thruster systems. They're used in propellant systems uh, for what's called a single-use case. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Pyro valves are all over the place. Um, and they manifold associated with, with expendable launch vehicles. And we have and even some reusable ones too. Isn't changing. And so what we would what we plan to do in flight is essentially. Um, that hey, rocket manifold gets open. All the helium valves uh, get open during what I would call prop activation during the launch countdown. Uh, you want to have the whole, all the thrusters available uh, for launch should, should you have the unlikely chance of a mass in the board. And so it remains open, uh, and we'll be feeding that leak, and we can actually see kind of what the leak rate is uh, when we open that system on the pad, and we can convince ourselves that the leak hasn't changed once the system is opened, we would keep uh, that system open all the way um, through docking, and then sometime after uh, we'd be docked to the ISS, we would then um, close all the heliums. We sort of deactivate the prop system once we dock to the International Space Station. Yep. And uh, once we close that, um, that manifold and all the other manifolds, once we dock, then we can, we can kind of see that the leak rate, what the leak rate has done, and then... The plan for undocking is we would uh, open all the heliums and have everything available for undock. And so that's sort of how we'll manage it in flight. And then, Mark, I'll let you take the second part of the question. Sure. Uh, so the common cause, what we looked at was uh, the design first to see how, this, how the design intent was met. And after several reviews with several experts, the design intent has been met. So that that makes us feel comfortable that had this had the seals are installed properly in the other flange locations that that this doesn't exist. Uh, an evidence that this doesn't exist is the fact that those all those other flanges are not leaking. They are solid, uh, no leakage whatsoever. So that that brings us to the conclusion that we have a pretty uh, pretty good installation on those seals and those flanges. And I, I would add a little bit to what Mark said. We went and looked at uh, the vendor. The vendor provided 59 seals that we looked at to inspect them to see if there were any defects on those seals. We also looked at the dimensions of those seals. We didn't see any issue with, with uh, any of those. Those are from the same lot. The way things happen in space flight is you, you want to make sure you have lot traceability on the hardware you're flying. So those are on the same lot that were installed in the service module. And then the, th the um, structural analysis really said that the joint should not leak um, with this particular seal configuration. We have, anytime you have a seal, you have something called squeeze. Essentially, are you really pressing on that seal? And that, that seal, that press of the two flanges on the seal, and then also the pressure that comes in keeps that seal um, in place to, to make sure we sealed. So we have pressurized the manifolds multiple times. Um, the only one that's leaking is this port. Um, doghouse helium manifold two, and then we have an analysis that backs that up that says, you know, we don't expect the others to leak, and I think that's the confidence that we have that we don't have a common cause failure mode. Uh, thank you. Next in the queue is Jonathan Seri from Fox News. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for doing this. Um, my question is probably for Steve about those backup launch dates on June 2nd, 5th, and 6th. Uh, do you know what times of day uh, you're looking at for each of those backup days? 
Uh, yes, I do have that information. Um, it, the launch time gets a little bit earlier, so June 2nd. The launch time is uh, 12.03 p.m. Eastern. And then we move into the morning on June 5th, 10.52 a.m. Eastern, and June 6th, 10.29 a.m. Eastern. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next question is from Gina Sinceri from ABC News. You, yes, thank you. You mentioned earlier that the healing leak wasn't something you could you were monitoring during the actual launch attempt. Uh, is it not necessary to monitor this? Uh, I, I just don't understand that. If you could explain it for me. Yeah, l let me try, and then we'll see if Mark has anything to add. Um, the helium leak is difficult to monitor during the launch count. We can detect helium leaks, but uh, the way the system works is when you when you activate the prop system and you open up um, all the, the plumbing, all the, the valves uh, that allows helium to flow from the tanks inside the service module throughout the system into those dog houses, it's very difficult to, to see a leak that's this this small. So we also think um, that this particular seal likely, because we talked about 27 of the 28 uh, flanges aren't leaking, we think, um, and we haven't had a chance to put eyes on the seal, obviously, because we can't take the flange apart, but we think there was likely, in talking to seal experts, there was some kind of defect in this seal. When they're manufactured, they have um, uh, some propensity to have a, a kind, of, kind of a place where the two sides come together, like a seam that could be a defect, or when they, they trim some of the material as it comes out of the mold, maybe there could be a little nick there, and then as you cycle it a few times, uh, perhaps that the leak got worse. And so it's very difficult to see a leak until you isolate the manifold, uh, and that's when we saw the leak is when we isolated the manifold. Uh, it's saving scrub, procedures. We identified the leak. Thank you, Steve. Our next question comes from Marcia Dunn from the Associated Press. Oh, yeah, it's probably for you, Steve, again. Um, uh, as I recall, there was mention of this helium leak during the countdown before the scrub. Um, and, and if not for the rocket valve trouble, would you have launched, launched back on May 6th, given this small sleek, leak as it's a good question. back then? And that would have been my so, question. What's the worst that could have happened if the leak grew in orbit? Thanks. Isolate the valve. Yeah, that's 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 a good question, Marcia. Uh, um, you know, we we Not bad, didn't see the leak during the countdown per se until after the scrub. So we we had no way to see the leak until the the scrub. So it was after we we scrubbed for um, the Centaur self-regulating valve that we saw the leak. Um, so if we hadn't had, I'll answer the question this way. So if we hadn't if we hadn't had the the scrub with the Centaur self-regulating valve, we would have launched. Um, and likely when we closed the manifolds uh, after docking, we would have seen the small leak, and we would have been able to manage it in flight uh, just fine. We would have done the same things. You know, we have at least uh, uh, seven or eight days while docked. We would have done the same kind of analysis relative to um, the size of the leak that we could, we could accommodate. We would have looked at the back half of the mission uh, relative to how many uh, feed in the leak um, after you uh, undock and what that meant for the orbit, and we would have managed it in flight. That's why they talked about that twin NOMAC thruster failure mode that Bill Harwood asked about, because they were, they're crunching the numbers. It's actually pretty damn good analysis, guys. I'll, I'll be 100% real with you. Good job on Boeing for doing their due diligence. When the scrub take place and be able to see Real good. Because we now know exactly where it was. We, we have done all the work that we just talked about to, to uh, understand the root cause, and that's going to help us with with improving the system in the future. So, you know, had we not, had we launched, obviously it would have been a safe flight and a successful flight, but we would have not known as much as we know today. Bingo. Okay, thank you. Next question comes from Irene Klotz of Aviation Week. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so for this next launch attempt, now that the leak is known and well characterized. Is there anything that can be done to monitor it during uh, the countdown, or is it going to be the same situation that it was on May 6th, where it won't even really register unless there's some other 
issue that happens that causes the uh, causes you to close the manifold down. I'm sorry, yeah. that's probably for Steve or Mark. I'll take a cut and see if Mark wants to add anything. Uh, now that we know uh, the the approximate leak rate, the size of the leak, the 70 to 80 pounds per square inch per minute. Um, we have characterized what that leak looks like um, with uh, the manifold actually pressurized, and we can see repressed cycles from, from the helium tank. And so it's, it'll take us maybe an hour after we bring the system up, but we can look at uh, how those repressed cycles are going um, and determine if the leak is about where we think it is today. And so that's what we're going to do pre-launch is we'll, we'll watch the system repress. Um, if it were to, to change or grow, um, we would then go isolate that manifold and see if we have anything else going on in another manifold. We could do that. So hopefully I answered your question. I'd only add that um, you know, our mission director, uh, Laura Kane, and our mission ops team have looked at this information and have developed you know, a plan in case we see something different or if, if, um, if we see it again, what exactly we're going to do and what the limits are on taking action. So we're, we're prepared to go into the launch countdown. Okay, thank you both. Uh, next up is Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Did I hear that right? They're not- Hi, thanks so much uh, for huh. Steve, I guess. Um, just real quick, I know you were looking at the helium leak and then that's when you discovered this redundancy issue on the deorbit burn, but is that related to the helium leak? Um, is the helium leak causing this concern about the redundancy? Uh, I just wonder if they're related. And you had said that this was a design vulnerability. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering, you know, uh, why it's just being caught now, if it's something you think you should have been caught earlier. Thanks. Yeah, those, that, that's a very good question. Yeah. Um, no, it's not. You know, I think I think the helium no, leak not. itself caused question. us to look a little bit more detailed oh at the manifolds and how the thrusters were architected off of each of those manifolds. And um, then we started looking a little bit more detail at question. some of these uh, on. failure cases where you lost an entire uh, helium manifold and, and one. Um, one of the dog houses and then in others. Um, and that, that's when we started to realize that when you have a, a total loss of a manifold, you could lose, in this case on manifold two in the port dog house, there's six OMAC thrusters and four RCS thrusters associated with that. I, I think that's when we started to, to realize that in this particular case, um, for this very remote set of failures, we could lose the the redundancy of the eight RCS aft firing jets for deorbit. So it just took us a little time to, to figure this out now. Um, question is, should we have seen this earlier? I think may, maybe in a, a perfect time frame we might have identified this earlier. I, my memory from shuttle is we had certain failure cases where we identified some kind of redundancy issues. We'd have to go back and get this set of circumstances. I do remember one time we, and I don't remember if this was the liquid hydrogen eco sensors or where, but we had great redundancy in the system. However, like in a wire bundle, we figured out that we were running all the signals for a particular piece of instrumentation or avionics through that same wire bundle. So effectively, we didn't have redundancy and we didn't have separation on the wire bundles like we should have had. So I think these things happen uh, in human spaceflight. It's very complex to look at the architecture for power and data to each thruster, then how you get oh. the fuel and oxidizer from different uh, plumbing to each thruster, and then the helium source for each thruster. So there's probably, uh, on this particular design, a few more things that go to each thruster that could lose the thruster. And we had identified almost all of them, but this one set of unique circumstances we, we didn't quite catch in our review. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Our next question it's an extremely remote Joe failure Lett, mode, guys. That's, yeah. Hey, thanks. Uh, question for Steve. Um, you, you say you think the leak, just so I'm understanding correctly, you say you think the leak was caused by a potential 
defect in the seal. Um, and shouldn't the the cause of the le- of the you know weak seal be something that you guys kind of want more certainty on before flying, or do you have more certainty on a different scenario? And if not a defect in the seal, for example, what else could it potentially be? Over torch flange. Yeah, all day. Very, very good question. When we when we talk to the seal experts, there's there's a few different kinds of things that can happen to the seal. You can you can have like I said a manufacturing defect. Uh, you could potentially have a, an installation error where you put the the seal in and it got squeezed or or crimped a little bit. That's my guess. Uh, it turns out that the best thing for the seal is uh, like we're going to do in flight, right? We're going to go uh, pressurize that seal for flight and then um, only depressurize it. Uh, well, the, won't take any pressure off if there's if there's no lo- leak at all on orbit. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but wow. it could have been a defect, could have been a manufacturing defect, could have been an installation defect uh, on our fall tree, could have been some, some FOD in the system, some kind of small thing that maybe rubbed a bit as we pressurized and unpressurized it. So those are kind of the things that, that we would say are on the fall tree. The, the beauty of our flight rationale for CFT, the crude flight test, is that we have looked at the other, um, the other 27 seals and the other 27 flanges by uh, doing a long-term decay check uh, when we were um, in the VIF. I think it was almost three days where we sat um, and were, um, we had the manifold closed. We weren't really feeding helium into the system. Those other manifolds were leak tight, which meant the flanges on those manifolds were leak tight. And uh, we also, you know, have cycled it several times. So we put the other flanges, the other 27 flanges, through the same sorts of things that cause the leak Good on analysis. the particular flange. And so we feel fairly confident that we won't have leaks in the other flanges. And if we had a leak, it might be a very small one. Um, so that's sort of our primary flight rationale on the uh, other other flanges. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. Our next question comes from Micah Maidenberg from the Wall Street Journal. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hey, Steve and Mark, you know, you, you've both previously talked about how you believe Starliner was ready for um, that May 6th flight. And then the, the leak, the design vulnerability weren't discussed sort of in the run up to May 6th. Um, is, there, do you, is there something missing in the readiness analysis? And are you concerned, you know, that these issues weren't ID'd, you know, sooner? Thanks. If there was something missed in the readiness analysis, the capsule would be up at the ISS leaking helium right now. Just saying. The, you know, just hardware putting it out there. issues or hardware failures are, are just part of our business. They, they're going to occur as we do launch preps. They're going to occur in Tone flight. Death, bro. Uh, there's Tone no death. human-rated vehicle that doesn't experience this kind of, of anomaly. <laughs> and the important thing is, is how do you react to it and how do you learn from it? Bingo. And, and I think that's what that guy what fricks. You've, you've this heard guy today. Is, You're this guy. How we've done that. That guy fricks. So no, I, I'm not. He knows how to space with our process that leads up to this. Um, we have uh, multiple redundancies in our system. Like Steve talked, we have you know a case here which was extremely remote that we missed. And if there are more out there, they're going to be in that same category of extremely remote. And I just added, I mean, it, this, this is a test flight, and we're gaining experience with this vehicle, and, and I think our, our spatial experience would say um, almost in some respect all 135 flights were test flights because we learned something on every single one of those flights. Um, this is like STS-1, the first shuttle flight in some respects of a new vehicle, and so I think we're still learning. Uh, this particular leak I don't think uh, implicates the design of the seal what or fire? the flange, it, it's just maybe a defective part. I uh, go back to my shuttle experience where we had, at times, leaking helium regulators and things like that that we had to manage. And in cases, we actually lifted off with some small leaks in the helium regulators uh, that we could manage in flight. So um, it's, you know, it's a tough system. This is a high-pressure system, and helium is a very small, tiny molecule, and it tends to, to leak. Um, uh, we can look at our Artemis Happens. experience with another tiny molecule, hydrogen, and they, they have had lots of struggles with leaks as well. But I think we understand this leak, and then I think we understand the rest of the vehicle. Um, we got to see the vehicle 
as it powered up, we got to see the vehicle on the pad and understand how it was performing. And, you know, we don't have any concerns for any other areas at this point. Actually, Gino, I think that, I mean, I don't think that Boeing is doing bad analysis here in this regard. I think they're doing really good analysis, but they also are getting an enema from NASA to make sure that the analysis is good, you know, figuratively. NASA. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, it's actually some pretty damn good analysis and design going on here. And this is what you want to do during a crew flight test, test being the operative word. You know, Steve Stitch just said a second ago, I'll pause for a second. Steve Stitch, who he was, he was a flight controller in the shuttle program for a long time, 37 years, he's worked in space flight. Uh, he was saying, the reason why I cringed at him saying, oh, we learn something every time with the shuttle program is because Look, man, he said, oh, every day, every test with the shuttle, every flight with the shuttle was a test. That is not how you conduct operational space flight. That's bad. You don't want to learn new things during operational missions. That's that's why I was like, Ugh, when he said that. But the flip side of that is that, you know. You're always going to learn something new there. The space space flight is just. It's just uh, such a high factor of difficulty. You do always learn something new. Ideally, what you want to be learning is more like what SpaceX is doing, where you're increasing, you're expanding the flight envelope of your vehicle. Learning about hardware faults 130 plus flights into the program is not, that's bad. That is, I like, that's not the flex you think it is, man. You know, that's, all of the all these teething problems from the entire show, shuttle program those should have been solved in the 80s but they weren't because we did four test flights on the most complicated vehicle ever designed and then called it a day now a capsule like this one not nearly as complicated however you you still don't want to learn new things during operational missions with the hardware the hardware should be well understood by the time you're you know you're going to put people on this for routine flights now with that being said, you can't you can't think of everything. There's always going to be an unknown unknown. We learned new things about the Apollo capsule when we were flying it out to the moon 50 years ago. Like uh, if you drop the oxygen tanks on the ground and then put it in and hope everything's fine, and they go to they go to stir the tanks and run an electric signal through into an oxidizer tank to stir a tank, and the seal is the Teflon seal is cracked because some moron dropped it. And you get an electrical arc through an oxidizer tank that heats everything up and blows the tank up on the spacecraft mid-flight. Yeah, probably shouldn't do that. Probably shouldn't do that. That's that's not that's not that's yeah, probably shouldn't drop the thing before you put it in the spaceship. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably not good for it. But just, the point is that we still learn new things with the Apollo capsule all the way even until the last mission that's not necessarily how it should be i, I think that spacex is this is something that spacex has on lockdown their high frequency of flight affords them to be able to you know to get all the hardware bugs and defects out of the design because of because of high frequency of flight and then like with falcon 9 right now it's just it is just straight up expanding the flight envelope because you know that this hard the behavior of this hardware is well understood and corrected now all that being said, this is the time during a crew flight test where you want to find these problems. You want to do the analysis. You want to get it right because you're putting people on it. Don't roll the dice like that. Any, any problems with commercial crew, even at this point, would be catastrophically bad for NASA, Boeing, just space flight as a whole. Catastrophically bad. I appreciate Boeing and NASA doing their due diligence to and doing good failure analysis here to make sure that this doesn't happen. I mean, it's totally fine to lose a capsule door mid reentry, right? It's a test flight. Uh, <laughs> that behavior probably is not something you want. That's you've probably figured that one out. <laughs> so, with that being said, I really appreciate the analysis here. It's quite good. They're, they've done a good job. It, it seems like, honestly, somebody just over-torqued a valve. Over-torqued the flange for that, for that helium valve. That's honestly what happened. I'm pretty damn sure. Like, yeah. Because that just differs a bit from what I'd initially heard. And then second, if I could just get an update Let me on just the remind program. this question. Uh, hi, this question is for Steve or maybe Mark. And it's really a follow-up to Marsh's question. Um, I just want to be crystal clear here. 
uh, that there was zero discussion of a helium leak before the decision to scrub. And I asked because that just differs a bit from what I'd initially heard. And then second, if I could just get an update on the crew when they'll come back to the Cape, that sort of stuff. Thanks. Oh, yeah, that sort of stuff. Hey, Steve, I think you've said it. I'll, I'll try it as well. Um, you know, I, I sat, and both Steve and I were in the uh, control rooms for the launch countdown, and uh, it wasn't until the, the scrub activities, the post-scrub activities, that we discovered this lake. So it was not talked about or seen until the post-scrub activities. And the latest that we have on the crew, uh, Steve, you can check me here, but the latest we had on the crew was that they were going to be flying to Florida on the 28th. Yeah, that's what I have as well, Mark. I think they're flying down. They usually travel about four days prior to launch, and I think they're traveling on the on the 28th, the day before the uh, agency F, uh, F Delta agency FTRR. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Lauren Grush with Bloomberg. Hi, thank you so much. I... Sorry if I missed this, but I'd like to expand on what I think Mark spoke about regarding metal-to-metal -metal contact at the seal where the helium leak is just to fully blow. So can you just explain what that would mean and how you would manage that? And I also remember there's some issues with a few thrusters on Starliner during the uncrewed test flight back in 2022. I just want to know if this helium leak and or the deorbit burn redundancy problem are related to those issues. Thanks. Right, so I'll try this, and then, Steve, you can jump yeah, in here, it. Sure. here for the uh, OFT1 activities. Uh, I don't believe those were related in any way to what we're talking about today. And the uh, when I was referencing the, um, the uh, metal, analysis metal rocket on the flange, what we did was we said uh, we wanted to understand the leak rate, and if it was to get worse, what could we tolerate? So some testing was done, and, and analysis backed it up that if we were to remove the seal completely and just torque the flange down, the leak rate would not exceed our capability to manage that leak. Uh, so that made us very comfortable that if this leak was to get worse, it would be acceptable for flight. Steve, over to you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark. Yeah, on Starliner 1, we, we had uh, some RCS thrusters fail off. Now, th those turned out to not be... Um, real thruster failures. Those were uh, essentially the software uh, in the integrated propulsion controller uh, failed off a, a totally good thruster. And so we've made some changes to in the software and the firmware uh, to go fix that. And so we shouldn't have those happen again. So, And we actually recovered those RCS thrusters. Uh, we did have uh, two um, OMAC thrusters that failed off uh, right during the orbit insertion burn on OFT-1, um, we went and ran the How? potential failure mode for those down. Again, as Mark said, we don't get the hardware back, unfortunately, in the service module because it gets disposed of in the ocean. But the, the cause, the likely cause of those, based on the signature and data that we saw, was was some sort of blockage that perhaps was was in the um, uh, in that manifold and on the fuel or oxide up to that thrust, thruster, and so. We went and did extensive boroscoping and cleaning and making sure that we didn't have uh, any kind of the, the fog that might have been present, um, uh, did extra checks on the vehicle. So we, we sh don't think we're going to have uh, the OMAC issue we saw in OFT-1, um, and that gives us confidence uh, in going to fly with, the, with this small helium leak. Hey, yes, what's going on? Huh. Thank you. Next up is Stephen Clark with Ars Technica. Hi, thank you. I think my question is probably from Mark or Steve. Uh, just a question on the seal. Uh, apologies if I missed this earlier. Uh, can you talk about what the seal is made of uh, and how big the dimensions of the seal? And uh, what would, you know, if you elected to replace the seal to, you know, solve this leak, uh, you know, with a hardware solution, what would that entail? Would you have to bring the spacecraft back to the uh, C3PF to do that? Yeah, let, let me talk the uh, material it. for the seal. It, it's a, I can get the details. It's basically a rubber, yeah. a rubber seal. It's just an O-ring. Um, think of it as a ring, almost like you would have in See? your um, faucet and your sink if you do your own plumbing work. The size of it, it's it's pretty small. I if do you, my own. Uh, I have a button-down shirt on, like I do. 
it's it's roughly the diameter of the of the button on your shirt, so it's pr- pretty small. And then the thickness of it, um, it's about the thickness of it, it's pretty thin. We would call it a 40, 40 thousandth of an inch. And if you took ten sheets of paper and stacked those together, that's how thin this seal is. And so um, that that is why um, we likely think. Uh, because it is such a thin seal uh, in terms of thickness that maybe there's a little defect in it. Uh, that's the most likely failure mode. When we talk to the vendor, you know, they have used this particular seal in other applications and have seen, you know, good good uh, reliability from it. We we saw good reliability uh, on OFT1 and uh, and also OFT2 as well with with these particular seals. So that gives us some confidence in it. Um, and then I, I did misspeak. I think the failures I talked about, I think I said OFT1 by mistake on the thrusters, the RCS thrusters and the OMAX, and it, it was really OFT2. And I'll let Mark talk about what we'd have to do if we were to go Yeah, um, it's a little tiny repair boy. the leak. They're going to have to detank yeah, the we capsule. Have, we did look They're going to do that. That would, would suck. Take to go ahead and, and change this seal out. And so the, the key piece hey, well, is that this is in a... You know, the hyper system, the MMH fuel and N2O oxidizer. Yeah, you need that not to that be there. It's in that flange. So we, we characterize that as a hot system. It's hazardous yeah. to go do that work. We would yeah. not be able to do that work out at the VIF. So nope. the vehicle would need to be destacked, brought back to the C3PF, uh, <laughs> safe in one way or the other, which would most likely involve deservicing the vehicle and then uh, going in an escape operation and, and changing the seal out. So it, it'd be quite involved. Thank you for that. Uh, Will Robinson-Smith is next up with Spaceflight Now. Yes, hi. So much for taking the time to answer our questions and <clears throat> policies. I'm fighting a cold, so hopefully my audio comes through clearly. Um, question for Steve as far as the timing of the mission and maybe for Mark as well. You mentioned that there may be some alterations to the deorbit burn should the, the need arise. In the ascent and going into docking, as uh, Butch and Sonny are doing some of the manual checkouts of Starliner, um, are there any thoughts to change the, the timeline or some of the, the manual operations that they're going to be doing? Uh, can you just go into a little more detail on, on what that may look like? Thanks. Yeah, this is Steve. Uh, right now, we don't envision any change to the flight plan uh, relative to um, any of the crew manual flying objectives that they plan to do um, or any of the rendezvous, as, as Dana said, that we've looked at the, the rendezvous uh, profile. We've looked at redundancy. We don't, we don't see any issues relative to this, this particular doghouse uh, leak. And I want to clarify the change at the end of the flight. We nominally plan to, to do the deorbit burn just the way we have on OFT1 and OFT2. We plan to do an OMAC burn. We have redundancy and we can yeah. handle an OMAC failure and still execute the deorbit burn. It would be in this pretty remote case where we lost the helium manifold totally in two different doghouses. So. And as Mark said, in the port dock house, if the leak rate were to increase, we can, we can feed that leak. We have the way to see what that leak rate is uh, during, during real time, uh, even on the way to station if that leak rate's increasing. Uh, we could always isolate that dock house temporarily, preserve helium, and then reopen it for critical burns or critical parts of the approach to ISS. Yep. So we have lots of options to, to manage that. And then the, the nominal plan is to execute the mission um, as as advertised, as we've planned for for many years, and again the deorbit burn will be with OMAX. Just like those we, are the dog houses right to. there. See that? These, remote These things. That we would have it's to the, the component that houses two, the thruster um, thruster block. Two burns with the four RCS jets. This thing. And I do hope you feel better. Oh, that's cool. See that? That's okay. the dog house covers up the thruster. From the Atlantic. See right there. Hi, a question for Mark. Um, before May 6th, your estimate for the probability of loss of crew for this mission was 1 in 295. 
Um, given the issues that have come up since, where does that ratio stand today? And a real quick question for Jim. You mentioned that part of the delay for giving us public updates is because you said we're moving pretty quickly. I can't. I um, just... Why? Why? What is driving that pace? And is there a reason you're not wanting to slow down as you work through these problems and even de stack the vehicle to reach that seal? Thank you. They just answered that, lady. So our, uh, they literally just, that was the last question. To to this as well. That's what they our, just stopped talking about. Posture, our probability is not related to this area at all. It's um, related to a different, different uh, cause. So, no, this does not affect that at all. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I would uh, agree, Mark. Yeah, go, go ahead, Jim. <laughs> I, I would say um, the my the the day the, the information was flowing really quick. We're moving quick to address the issues. Um, Steve and the, and and his team and Mark and their teams were were meeting every day, uh, doing analysis, getting new information. They they've shared with you kind of how some of this progressed, and uh, we're, we're never moving too quick that we're. We're compromising safety. We're moving quick to get the information, do the analysis. Yeah, what I do. And uh, they will. And, and get to flight, but we, we're not going to fly until uh, we're sure we're safe. I just, dude, look, man, I understand people don't understand this stuff. Thanks, Jim. This stuff is really complicated. Uh, next up is Anthony Leone from Spectrum News. This stuff is really complicated and it is difficult to understand. It really is. I've been trying to figure this out for years and only like probably like I've been doing straight. I've been streaming and learning about space flight for better part of a decade. I really only got a good grasp on it probably in the last two to three years of how everything works and the mentality needed to do this correctly. That was after eight years of struggling. I mean, in KSP, reading about this stuff, understanding how it works. But the most important thing was understanding the mentality. Like why you would do this this way? Why? Where is single fault redundancy a good idea? Uh, uh, which, but you know, why would single fault redundancy be a good idea as opposed to double fault redundancy, like two fault redundancy in a spacecraft? And how this risk ad adversion and management gets implemented at a systematic level? Basically, why? What you know? Why did this part fail? Why did it fail? How did this happen? You know, like stuff like that. Figuring out the mentality for it was. It, it took me a long time. With that being said, look, man, if you're not going to listen to the teleconference and just wait for your question to ask and then ask a question that literally just got answered, how interested are you in this? You just is, is this just your job? Is this your day job? Like, I get it. I understand. But I mean, honestly, there's easier things to be a journalist about. Like, like, honestly, like, I, I'm not trying to gatekeep or anything, right? I'm not trying to I'm not trying to gatekeep or anything, but do you even care? That question was just answered a second ago. Like Are you serious? They just talked about this a moment ago. Like I It's so hard to understand these things without doing them. That's the gap I try to bridge here, fish. Uh but like look man, I understand that people want to just do this as the day job, right? But there's there's you know, asking a question because, you know, you're generally interested in, you, not, you don't even need to be interested in space, but generally interested about the journalism behind this stuff. And then there's just blatantly not paying attention. There, like, there's people that I see at the, there's, there's journalists at these media teleconferences that are just there because their boss said, you need to be at this teleconference to get information. Like, they, you, they, like, it, it seems like, seems that some of these folks don't even, don't care. They don't, they don't care because if you care, you would be listening, you would have been listening instead of checking, instead of being on Instagram and then waiting for your turn to speak or wherever, the, wherever the, whatever you were doing, answering emails or whatever. Now, granted, I answered an email well during this press conference, but I understand the source material and I understand what went wrong. And I was listening while that was going on. Did you guys even notice that I answered an email? Nobody noticed. And I'm still able to convey the source material here. Like. That took a long time to, to, to cultivate. And I understand this does take a long time, but geez, man, listen. Like, it, it just drives me up the wall, man. Like, are you guys just here for a paycheck? Do you even care? Like, do you even care about writing a good story? Like, that's your job. Like, I, I guess I just don't understand that. You know what I'm saying? Perhaps you needed to ask it for their news service. Yeah, Christoph, that's a, you know, I always have to remember that too. You know, A, 
some people don't care about space as much as I do. And that's fair. Like, I, I, I'm a little bit obsessive with it. I get that. Like, I understand. And also, sometimes people ask these questions to get on the record. You know, say, well, I asked the journalist this question, and this is what they said. But, like, to imply, lo like, loss of crew stat in a very, very, very isolated fault tree analysis tells me you know nothing about space flight. You're, you're just there. That That is an instant giveaway that you don't know what you're talking about. Has the loss of crew probability increased for this helium leak? They've literally spent this entire press conference saying that this is a very minor issue. And had the chattering valve on Centaur not been chattering, the spacecraft would be up there right now. And they would have isolated this problem on the ISS and, it, and they would have figured out a contingency procedure for EDL, for entry, descent, and landing. They, they, they've said this, like, this is what the whole, this is the subject matter of the entire interview. Are you even listening? Like, changing probability of loss of crew isn't the question, like, that's not, that is not even remotely close to the subject matter being discussed here. That's like us talking about engines on a car, like, oh yeah, the engine has the piston that goes up and down, and somebody asked, yeah, but what about the tires? What about the tires? Well, the engine is connected to the tires, so it could affect the tires. We're not talking about the tires, we're talking about the engine. I mean, yeah, you're right. We're talking about the engine. Yeah, but the tires, though. What? Like, you see what I mean? It, it just, it, it, right there, it tells me you, you, you're not, you're just asking a question to ask a question to get on the record. There's, you know, oh, well, you know, nobody's asked about loss of crew. Maybe there's a reason why. Like, that's what I'm getting at. And, you know, like, once again, I'm not trying to gatekeep. I'm not trying to be a douchebag about this. Like, I understand not everybody's going to know. This stuff takes time to understand. With that being said, I, I guess the disconnect here is just me not understanding why you wouldn't want to put the effort in here. Like, even to write a good story or to write a good report. Like, it's very weird to me. Like, that's a foreign concept to me. I don't, the concept of not putting, like, effort in for your work really is something I don't, I don't really understand. <laughs> Like, my mind has trouble with it. With that being said, you know, I understand people go to work and they just do what's good enough. I get it. I, I do understand that, you know. But, yeah, it's just strange. That's a strange line of questioning. It's not really relevant to subject matter. Someone that works, someone that works on the technical side of things where people do often care about the work, I've realized most of my business side partners are just there for their paycheck, not... Not a bad, not a bad thing. Work is work, but it's true. Eh, Johnny, I, I don't know, man. I guess I have trouble. I have trouble. I have trouble understanding that as somebody that loves spaceflight. I am horribly biased towards, like, any type of spaceflight. Like, just horribly biased. Like, frick you, we should go further. We should be on the moon. We should be on Mars. We should be on Jupiter. I don't care. Yeah, I said it. Gas giant. Let's go. Figure it out. Like, <laughs> I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but... Well, okay, we'll go with the Jovian moons, all right? Io, Ganymede, let's go. We should be there right now. Come on, we were on the moon 50 years ago. We should we should be out in the outer rim. We should be we should have a base on Pluto right now. It's ridiculous. You know, I, I guess it's just something that's so ridiculously important to me. I, I guess I I guess I get a little annoyed when people don't take it seriously. You know what I mean? Find the map. Find the monolith. Damn it! You're right. Cloud City, let's go. But anyway, sorry, rant over. I'll shut up. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking our questions today. Uh, this one is uh, for Steve. Um, so just to, to recap, um, we're going to launch, uh, even though there's a leak. So my question is, how confident are you that this issue that has caused the leak because of the seal in the thruster control system, are you confident that won't worsen uh, during the launch vibration, plus being in orbit and then re-entry. Um, I know you're uh, talking about that, but it, it sounds like there's definitely uh, some concern if you guys are thinking of backup plans. Thank you. Okay. So, so, okay. All right. Here. This guy just might be understanding. He might just be asking this question to understand, and that's fair. 
this is this is the stretch that took me so long to figure out and it takes everybody a long time to figure this out this is, there's a reason why you got to go to school for a very long period of time to be an aerospace engineer or any type of engineer it's very stringent the courses are extremely hard it will fry your brain i haven't done i haven't even taken engineering courses and i know that i've talked to enough people to know it's it's going to, it's like boot camp for your mind okay now with that being said He's asking about, well, if you know it's leaking, why are you going to launch? And what's your, what's your plan when it does leak on orbit? There was a reason they discussed contingency plans a second ago. They, they, they were discussing potential contingency plans for this, for this leak. And the biggest reason, here's the biggest one, the biggest one. This is a very, 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 very isolated failure mode. In plain English, it's not that big of a deal. The plain, plain English way of saying this, even and NASA won't say this. They won't, they won't say it. But look, look at the doghouse. See that? There's a lot of thrusters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In each doghouse, there's a lot of thrusters. There's a ton of redundancy here on purpose. The reason why there's a lot of thrusters is because these are shuttle thrusters that have been fitted. They're shuttle RCS, the vernier thrusters from the shuttle and the shuttle uh, main reaction control system components, that's all shuttle stuff right there. That's why. They reused a bunch of shuttle parts. Not the actual pieces. They're, they're new, but the same components. There's a lot of extra thrusters on this thing. There's, there's enough redundancy that makes this an extremely isolated failure mode. The reason why they delayed in the first place is to verify that that helium leak is there and understand it on the ground because it's easier to understand it on the ground when you can put hands on the spacecraft rather than it orbiting around on up in space and not being able to see your service module. See what I mean? This is about this is what I mean about the mentality. He said, "Oh, well, do you have a contingency plan for when it launches and when it's le when it when it leaks?" Yeah, of course. But they wouldn't have figured out that contingency plan if they hadn't discovered the leak in the first place. See what I mean? It's very, very cold logical thinking. It's really, it's really hard to wrap your mind around this if you're not, if you're not like, uh, if you're not like super into it. It takes a ton of time. Look, they hadn't found the helium leak. They would, you know, they would have sent it. They would have discovered it on orbit when they, when the Starliner docked and they, they went through the same safing procedure for the thrusters. They would have found it. And then they would have come up with a contingency procedure while the capsule was up on the ISS. And then they, it would have landed. It would have landed just with a two-part deorbit burn instead of a single part. Steve Stitch said that. Okay? Now, at the end of the day, guys, this isn't a big deal. The reason why it's being delayed is just so they could take the time to understand the behavior. Because it's easier to do it down here than it is up there. Starliner could launch right now. It's really not a problem. There's a lot of thrusters on it. It's v and once again, that's the plain English way of saying it. The more complicated way of saying it is that this is a super isolated failure mode, but they only figured out that it was a super isolated failure mode because of the analysis that was chosen to be done that delayed Starliner. See what I mean? It's kind of a weird, like, backwards roundabout way of thinking, you know? And that guy might just be trying to learn, the guy that asked this question. That's fair. I understand that everybody's at different levels of learning, right? But... I guarantee you what they're going to say here is that this is an isolated fault. It's not that big of a deal. The reason why is it delayed isn't because that they, they're going to do anything about it. It just, gives, it just gives them time to understand the capsule better. And now is the time to do that. You do that down here so you don't, because it's, it's harder to do it up there. You don't want to fail up there. Right? Even for a small issue like this, it's good to get a good baseline and understand the behavior. You know what I mean? That's very, 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 very important. But they wouldn't have found it if they weren't anal retentive about figuring out this stuff. That's what I mean about doing good analysis. So yeah, they do have a contingency plan. They would have had a contingency plan even if they had launched it on the 6th. It, would have been, it really wouldn't have been a big deal. This is not that big of a problem. It's so much that it, it, it's not even that big of a problem that they're not even they're not even going to replace the valve. They're just going to understand the behavior and adapt the mission profile for it. Now, the reason why they're going to do that is once again because getting a good baseline with your crew flight test is really important. But here's the thing: deintegrating the capsule right here, taking the capsule apart, safing the capsule. Bringing it back to the Starliner processing facility, replacing that valve, sending it back to fueling, refueling the capsule, and then restacking the capsule is enough of a deviance there that 
it's actually a better baseline just to leave it there with the leak. Think about all the extra stuff that you have to do to that. That's affecting your baseline, right? Because not every star liner is going to be stacked. Get ready to launch, scrub, be taken apart, unfueled, refueled, put back on the pad and launched again. Future missions are not going to do that. So it would be better to get a baseline here because this is such a tiny, tiny thing. It would be better just to not do that, just to have, just to deal with the leak. That's what I mean. It, I know it sounds super counterintuitive, but that is a better bench test than taking apart the valve, sending the capsule back to processing, taking the thing apart, putting it back together and sending it. It would, that actually would be a worse baseline because you're not going to do that with every capsule in the future. So you wouldn't think of that, right? That's, it's weird. It's a weird way of thinking, but that's what I mean about wrapping your head around this stuff. It's a very, very peculiar way of thinking about these problems. It adds way more risk, Ninjax. Exactly. That's way more, uh, dude, taking the capsule apart at this point, that's way more dangerous than just living with that helium leak. That's what they're trying to say, but sometimes NASA has troubles trying to say it in plain English. They're used, sometimes they're good at that, sometimes they're not. It depends on the questions that the journalists ask. Anyway, yeah, trying to replace that valve would undo months of baselining, baselining work. If you decided, if they decided to take apart that thing right now, Starliner would not launch till the end of the year. It's better to just live with the leak. That's a better bench test than trying to replace it. As long as they're confident that they know why that valve is leaking, then it's not a problem. You know, and I know what people, I, I can already see it now. I know what journalists are going to spin this into. NASA's going to, Boeing is going to launch with a leaky valve. They're going to launch with a leaky valve. They knew about the leaky valve. What kind of failures could this lead to? And we already saw a journalist ask that question. What's the probability increase of loss of crew? See, that's the wrong way to think about it. That's not how you space flight. That is not correct. That is not the right mentality for understanding space flight. You got to go backwards. You got to think about it like backwards instead of forwards. See what I mean? It, it, this is hard to understand, man. It's so difficult. I still get it wrong. I've been doing this for a decade. I still get it wrong from time to time. The process of fault management. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Boeing went through this. Boeing went through this flow chart here. There you go, Rocky. I'll link it up. They went through this flow chart with that valve right there. Now, if you don't know what some of these words mean, that's fair. To be honest, I don't know what some of these words mean, but I know this is fault management. Can you explain the backwards, not forwards part? Sure, 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 sure. Okay. All right. ASAP, let me, let me, let me try to put it to you in plain English, okay? So after the scrub on May 6th, they were shutting down the thruster systems. You have to prime these thruster systems. Now, wh what do you mean? How, how do you prime these things? Well. All of the thrusters, uh, the, the reaction control systems, the little tiny thrusters that are used for maneuvering around in space, right? You're not going to need a gigantic freaking rocket engine up there when you're going to dock to a space station. That's way too much power. You got to make little, little tiny, simple maneuvers to get to a docking port and dock to the ISS, right? So you got, you got to have little thrusters. These thrusters are called reaction control systems or RCS for short. Starliner has four thrust, what are called thruster blocks, Okay. One, two, three, and four. They're at 12, three, six, and nine. These things are called dog houses. Inside of one of those, one of those dog houses, on one thruster, on one of those dog houses, the thrusters are pneumatically actuated. So what these thrusters do, they're little, they're little rocket engines. That's what they are. They're little, they're little tiny rocket engines that maybe, I don't know, the, the diameter of the nozzle is about the size of a golf ball maybe. They're really, really small. Now, what, what do these thrusters do? How are they fueled and how are they actuated? I said that it's a pressure-fed system. So equal and opposite reactions. Up in space, you don't need a lot of thrust to get to move, right? You're, you're, you're going fast enough where you're falling around Earth, so you don't need much reaction mass to move in a certain direction. So the, these guys, that's why these guys are really, really small. Also, you need to do precision maneuvers to get to a docking port, right? Now, how do they work? They're helium actuated. So what are they doing? Are they just shooting helium out the capsule? No, 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 that's not, that's, that's very inefficient. It, it'd work, but it's very inefficient. 
What that helium does in these thrusters right here is actuate valves that shoot rocket fuel and oxidizer into these things. In order to make combustion, in order to make an explosion, you need fuel, air, and you need heat. Okay? Now, the fuel on these thrusters, okay, is monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, MMH and NTO, all right? So take this into account. I'm getting to the backwards thinking part, Asap. Just give me a second. Take this into account. NTO and MMH, you touch it, you die. It's that simple. It's very good as a spacecraft propellant on orbit because even in the vacuum, NTO and MMH, because they're some weird chemicals, uh, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, they stay liquid. They don't boil off. They don't decompose. They just stay there because it's some chemical from hell. And if you touch it, you die. Okay? Take that into account. Remember that. All right? Because that, that very much plays into, plays into this. Okay? Now... Helium opens up solenoids here. Solenoids are just valves that open and close. You have solenoids on your car if you have an internal combustion engine. Fuel injectors are an electronically actuated solenoid. An electric signal gets sent, sent the solenoid valve opens, fuel gets sprayed into your engine, solenoid valve closed when the electrical signal stops. That's an electrically actuated solenoid. These are pneumatically actuated solenoid. Now, why pneumatics? Why use pneumatics? Well, Generally, you don't really want electrical stuff being near the rocket engine, the thing that explodes. Electricity generates heat. Heat makes things pop with the right, in the right conditions. So they're using pneumatics. They have a pneumatic opening valve with inert gas. Non helium's non-reactive. So helium gets pressurized to these valves, and they helium, when when the increase, when they have increased pressure in the valve, the valve opens, sprays NTO and MMH into the rocket motor, those things, the, the propellants that can kill you, right, if you breathe them. It sprays that into the rocket motor, and when, MM, when MMH and NTO chemically combine, they explode. The chemical reaction that, that you get from mixing MMH and NTO generates an insane amount of heat and makes combustion. There, it's called a hypergolic propellant, okay? So... Very good for a spacecraft, very good for spacecraft fuel. It, it lasts an insanely long time on orbit. So you're going to anchor this capsule at the ISS. You can't have your fuel decompose over time. That does happen with other capsules. Soyuz, for instance, uses um, an ammonia thruster system and ammonia will decompose over time up in space. So the capsule has a shelf life. You have a much longer shelf life with NTH and MMO. Uh, NTO and MMH, sorry. So... Okay, so those propellants, pressure fed. Helium controls the valves that open and close here, okay? Helium also pressurizes the propellants so the propellants squirt into the, into the, um, it also back pressurizes the system so NTO and MMH can, are under pressure and get sprayed into the um, nozzle. But that's not, that's not the part that failed here. The part that's, the part that's really weird is the pneumatic system going to the actuator. So the thing that opens and closes, okay? All right, so now you know, NTO and MMH, bad for you. These systems, pneumatically actuated, so they're using pneumatic valves. That's a pneumatic valve controller right there, I'm pretty damn sure. That has all the all the, all the, the valve actuations and all the hard lines going to all the valves. See that? Also, the cable management is ace on that. It's very, very, very aesthetically pleasing to look at. But see all these metal lines in here? Those are your pneumatically actuated valves. Right, and that's that's most likely your valve controller right there. I'm taking a guess. I don't know. I'm taking a guess, but what I know about hardware, it seems right. So, all right, why? Okay, so you go to save the capsule after the Centaur has a malfunction. Okay, you go to save the capsule. When they save the capsule, part of it is depressurizing the valve actuators because when the thing launches, you're going to need these. After you get into space, you're going to need that. You, you ideally want them ready to go when the capsule separates from the upper stage. So, they begin safing. Now, what's safing? Safe. My lawnmower's on. Now, what's safing? <laughs> My father-in-law wanted to use the ride-on mower. So, if you hear the lawnmower in the background, that's what's going on. So, 
they went to safe these systems, okay? And they discovered that one of those lines going to the actuator that, that delivers fuel, or that controls the valve that delivers fuel into the rocket engine was leaking. They did that because they shut them down in series. They don't shut them all down at the same time. They shut down one, shut down two, shut down three, shut down four. You got to bring the line. You got to bring the pressure down in the lines, right? And because while they were shutting down all the valve actuators, right, they found one. They went. They went to shut it down, and the pressure dropped really, really fast comparatively to the other ones. You would see that in the telemetry from Mission Control. The guys that are, you know, the guys that the guys that wear the black ties and thick rim glasses in the in the flight control room they would see that on the telemetry and see the the helium level went down faster on this one than the other ones okay so you might have a leak here so you might have a leak right He wanted to use the rod on mower. He thought it was cool, so I let him use it. I, I gave him the cl cliff notes on how to use it. It doesn't sound like it's going very well, but he'll figure it out. So, they figured out that there's a leak. Now, here's the thing. Okay, you have a leak on one out of the 27 valves that are on this thing. You have a leak on one of them. So now what do you do? You look at that. You see it drains hydrogen more than the... Or drains helium more than the other one. Now what? Okay, well, let's make sure that the other ones work correctly. So, you know, they probably went and repressurized all the other ones and then flip them on and flip them back off. Very simple stuff, right? And they figured out all, everything else is working just fine. The rate of helium depressurization is fine comparatively to that one out of 27. So, okay, here's the thing. You have one out of 27. Do you think it's a hardware problem? No, it's probably not. If one out of the uh, out of 27 valves is malfunctioning, it's probably an isolated incident, right? So right there, they probably figured out on the first day, right, that this is one in 27, not a big deal. There's redundant thrusters all over the place on Starliner because it's borrowing a bunch of shuttle thrusters for its service module. So... There's also multiple redundant thrusters pointing in the same direction for this exact, for this exact reason. See how there's two of them right there? And then there's three of these right here. And Starliner has four of these housings. There's redundant thrusters all over the place. Redundant thrusters is smart. Very smart. Shuttle did that. Very good design. Now, okay, so they, f they figured out on the first day that this is a very isolated incident. And if, if, if it does leak... It's not that big of a deal. But here's the thing. You have some downtime. They have to change the valve. The original thing that scrubbed the mission, they got to change the valve on Centaur anyway. So there's going to be some downtime where the capsule's in inside of the... There's going to be some downtime where the capsule's inside of the hangar, you know, while they're replacing the valve. So you might as well figure out exactly what's going on. That was the original reason why they delayed it. So when it went from the 17th to the 25th, when it scrubbed on the 6th, they said that it'll launch on May 17th. That is the time it took to change the valve on Centaur. And while that was going on, Boeing also did some fault tree analysis, right? They went back and made sure that what they saw in Mission Control the day that it scrubbed is actually what's going on, and it was. Okay, so... Because of this, right? And this is where the backwards thinking comes into play. They verified that that thing is leaking. It's leaking pretty bad. It could get, at full pressurization, it can get up to 50 PSI a minute. That's, a, that's hissing. You'd hear that. You would absolutely hear the right? Now, remember how I told you that NTO and MMH are very, 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 very hazardous. You you breathe like one ppm. You're that's it. You game over. You you lose either one of them. Okay, so think about this for a second. Boeing verified that that valve is good to go, right? And here's here's where the backwards thinking comes into play. Okay. So they know you understand that that helium valve is not working. Now, if you wanted to replace this helium valve. It's attached to a hot system, meaning it's fueled. You, you don't just go at it with a wrench on a hypergolic system, 
no, no suit, no hazmat, no nothing, and start wrenching around. If you accidentally make a leak and the guy breathes in M MMO or NTH, dead. Dead. It's not, even, it's not even a judgment call. This stuff is terrible for you. Like nerve gas bad. Not good. Right? So, here's the backwards thinking. What do you do? To replace this one valve that's in 27... Not 27 times redundant. It's not. The thrusters, the 27 thrusters in the system are all pointing in different directions. At the very least, it's one-eighth redundant. So there's eight fault redundancy in the thrusters. That was implemented by design because they wanted to reuse shuttle thrusters because propulsion research is a pain in the butt. Making new rocket engines is annoying. Why would you do that unless you absolutely needed to? Case in point, let's take Falcon 9. Falcon 9 required an engine that hadn't had never existed before to come back down and land. So that's when propulsion research was warranted. But even Falcon 9's Merlin engines are about as simple as you can get for a gas generated gas generator Carolox engine. They're very simple. Long story short, redesigning thrusters takes time. That's the most important part. If the thruster doesn't work, you're not spacing today, right? Now, what do you think would be an easier route? Because remember, the whole purpose of this is to get a good baseline. That's what this crew flight test is about. You want to get a good baseline. The crew flight test is supposed to represent the idealized processing flow of what a future operational mission is supposed to be like. Ideally, you don't want to learn anything, but sometimes you're going to. That's just the nature of the business, all right? How you what you do with that information, with that newly learned information separates, you know, uh separates like what SpaceX does from any other company, right? How you how you process and how you understand that information is important. Here's the key. Okay? So, you know that thing is you know that thing is malfunctioning, you know the rate at which it's malfunctioning, you understand that. That is attached to a fuel system that is very very volatile. So what do you do? Say you want to replace that thruster, okay? Remember, keep in mind, ideal baseline mission What's the ideal baseline? You stack the capsule together once, you roll it out to the pad, send it, and it works perfectly, right? That's your ideal. Now, here's where the backwards thinking comes in. I'm getting to it, I swear. This is complicated stuff, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm talking slow, all right? Now, which one... Now, keeping in mind that you're trying to get the closest baseline you possibly can to what an ideal mission looks like, which one of these scenarios better mimics that. If you roll with the valve that is A, at least eight fault redundant because there's other thrusters, right? And B, under, you understand the rate of leak, right? Because of those two, you send it, you deal with the leak on orbit. Or B, you want to replace that valve to get a better baseline. Okay, doing that, you got to unstack the capsule, take the capsule off the service module, send the service module to a special refueling area because you know what, it's not like a gas station. You can't just put the gas in and get and be set to jet. You, there's a special fueling depot at the Cape where they load, where they fuel spacecraft with these hypergolic propellants. It, it looks like something out of a sci-fi movie. There's guys in space suits. They're actually like, they're called scape suits. Scape suits are, they, it looks it looks like a space suit. It basically is, for all intents and purposes, because you do not want to breathe this stuff. It is a 100% confined suit. No leaks. And you have a personal oxygen pack. It's like scuba diver and a spaceman kind of combined. S-C-A-P-E, scape suits, if, anybody, if anybody's wondering. So now you got to take the capsule off. You got to take the service module. You got to take the capsule off the service module. You got to send the service module back to the fueling depot, right? They have to take all the fuel out, and then you have to take the service module, bring it back to the factory, which is at the Cape. It's it's by the VAB. It's in one of the shuttle orbital processing facilities. It's called uh, facilities. It's called the C3PF, Commercial Crew Cargo Processing Facility, C3PF. You got to take it back to the C3PF. You have to undo the work. Just because that valve is malfunctioning doesn't mean you're gonna you know just oh it's just one wrench let's just take it apart. You might have to take apart other things here, right? And those other things, after you take them apart and put them back together, that all has to be documented. All right? Now that you, you know, you took this apart, some of these things are only designed to be attached once. You might have to replace some of this stuff. 
right? The service module is only designed for one use. It's not reusable. So some of this, you know, because of that might be something that, you know, like a nut or a bolt or something. It, it should only be torqued once and stretch the nut once, right? You might even have to, so you have to replace the valve, you have to replace the seals, you have to replace the flanges, and who knows what you have to take apart in that freaking mess to get at that valve, right? You have to do all that. You have to hope that that goes right. You know, it, it probably it probably would be fine. Now you put the capsule back together, put the service module back together, put the capsule back on, send it back to fuel, send it back to the send it back to the launch site. That'll take months to get that right, because fueling these things takes time and it's a very slow process. It takes about a week, because you don't want to you you want to you want to slow fill these things because it takes time. Now, once again, you do all that. Or you live with the crappy helium thrust thruster and you deal with it in, in space because you have redundant thrusters. Which one of these options seems like a better bench test? This is where it gets a little backwards. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. This one. This one is the right. That is the right call. Absolutely the right call. Because an idealized baseline mission doesn't involve sending the capsule to the pad and then sending it back, taking it apart, putting it back together, and then putting it back on the pad. That's not ideal. That's not the idealized mission that the crew flight test is aiming to accomplish. Long story short, it's better to live with the leak. And that's where that kind of backwards mentality comes from. Honestly, that's pretty damn good risk assessment on Boeing and NASA's part. That It really is. That's really smart. Do you want to go take that whole thing apart? Who knows? Maybe somebody goes to take it apart and breaks another thing, and then your capsule's screwed even more. It's better to live with the leak that's well understood. It's better to live with it. Does that make sense? And I know that seems backwards. That seems like, what? Are you crazy? It's leaking. What are you, dumb? But that's what I mean about thinking this way versus thinking that way. You gotta, you gotta go back to it. You gotta understand all the components involved and understand how much of a pain in the butt it actually would be to go and replace that valve. It, you would be introducing so many variables into the, the, you know, the processing flow. The processing flow is basically putting the capsule together, stacking it, making sure it's good, going to fueling, stacking it on the rocket, you know, getting crew on board and getting it ready to go. Screwing with that processing flow, right? By going backwards a couple steps and then going forward a couple steps, right? Is going to introduce more variables than a known and well understood leak. Right? That's what I mean. It seems super counterintuitive, but this is actually a really damn good lesson in risk management. Because, see, if you were thinking safety here, if you were thinking safety, well, we want we want to be safe. And this is this is an important lesson on how perceived safety can be actually more dangerous. Okay, this is this is this is textbook. Right? The safe thing to do would be to replace that valve. But by being safer and replacing that valve, you're introducing more variables into the processing flow of the capsule that wouldn't be there in future test flights. The safe, de the safe decision here is actually more risky. Weird, right? It's weird, huh? That's what I mean about backwards thinking. ASAP, does that make sense? Sorry, I didn't mean to talk your ear off, but sometimes it's rocket science, man. It, sometimes it takes a second, you know? Yeah, Blue, exactly. Plus, when you take apart the rocket, you have parts, launch pad, rocket just sitting for months, which is very bad for unknown unknowns. Yep, yep. Thanks. You made it perfectly clear. That's what I mean. Dude, space flight is full of stuff where you have to. It, it, dude, it is full of logic puzzles like that that are such a pain in the ass to solve. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, it's completely backwards. And now, I, dude, I don't envy the guys in this press conference because they have to sit there and they have to try to explain this to somebody that's like, well, what if you kill people? What if there's an increased probability of people dying? That's what I mean. That person, the person that asked that question does not understand at all the risk management techniques that NASA is using. They're not even making an effort to understand it. That's what pisses me off. Like NASA has to sit there and try to explain what I just did like in five minutes. It took me 15, 20 minutes to, to kind of iron that whole thing out. No, Pigeon, they're not going to replace the valve. Replacing the leaky valve is more risky, believe it or not, than just dealing with a leak that you know, you understand the behavior. Also, Rocky, also all spacecraft have 
a thing called mate demate limitations too. <clears throat> These can only be attached and detached a number of times where you need to replace parts. So that also must be taken into account. So a simple assessment conclusion is the risk of going with the leak is smaller than the risk of replacing. Bingo. I mean, Rocket Guy, I know you understood this, right? See what I'm talking about? That's that's what I mean. It's backward thinking. It you really it's really hard to wrap your mind around this stuff. But you have to have a damn good knowledge of how the spacecraft works. Like me, I've been sitting here trying to brute force this into my freaking caveman head for a decade, and I'm still I still get it wrong from time to time. There's a reason why I don't work for NASA. <laughs> yeah, NASA, if you want, pretty good. And, and your boy, your boy's getting better at this. Anyway. Yeah, it's that it it's completely counterintuitive thinking. Rocket science is full of stuff like that, and that's where the phrase "it's not rocket science" comes from. Everybody touts around the space, you know, the phrase "oh, space is hard." Space is oh yeah, space is really difficult. Space, but nobody ever nobody ever bothers to delve into why it's difficult because some of the some of the thinking is completely counterintuitive. It's it, it's completely ridiculous thinking. Like you're gonna launch it with a leak? What are you nuts? Yeah, of course. Launching it with a leak that we understand is safer. That's actually better. That is safer for the crew than trying to take that whole thing apart and putting it back together. And that's that's really counterintuitive. You wouldn't think about it that way. Yeah, I'm good at this and you get Spaceballs quotes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that clears some things up. So now that you guys kind of understand that, right? Listen to some of these questions and you'll see why I'm like, Ugh, you just made my brain hurt. But then again, once again, there are people that are trying to learn and I understand that. But here, listen to the next question. There's only a couple more. Yeah, uh, good question. I, I would say... Um, here, the, the... let's back it up. To recap. Hello, oh. everyone. Uh, thank you for taking our questions today. Uh, this one is uh, for Steve. Um, so just to, to recap, um, we're going to launch, uh, even though there's a leak. So my question is, how confident are you that this issue that has caused the leak because of the seal in the thruster control system, are you confident that won't worsen uh, during the launch vibration plus being in orbit and then re-entry? Um, I know you're uh, talking about that, but it, it sounds like there's definitely uh, some concern if you guys are thinking of backup plans. Thank you. They wouldn't have set a launch date if they weren't confident in any of that being completely fine. Once again, crew flight test. Crew, operative word. They wouldn't have set a date on June 1st if they weren't sure. All right. See what I mean? See how weird that question sounds now that you understand the context? It's a very strange question to ask. Watch. I guarantee you they'll they'll pause for a second and they'll be like, uh yeah, okay. Well, watch. They're good. Steve's gonna say that right now. Ready? Yeah, uh, good question. I, I See? would say See? Um, I told you the reason we're confident. See? Two, two different aspects of confidence and flying. Yeah, uh... One, we've characterized the leak um, uh, through various pressure Listen. cycles, and the leak is, is relatively stable. And then we've, as Mark said, done a couple of bounding analysis. Um, we actually, as Mark said, took, took the whole seal, assuming the seal is not in this particular flange, and we can manage even that leak rate, which is 100 times worse than this one. Um, and also, we've looked at the other manifolds, and they're not leaking. And then we have a, a really good analysis uh, of the of the structure, and then what the stresses are in this particular seal. And I would say the ascent time frame is not going to put a lot of stress on this particular seal. Um, what happens when the seal is uh, is pressurized, or you have uh, pressure across it? I mean, it takes a certain um, set in the in the groove that it's in. And it, it expands against the walls, and it's in a stable configuration. When we've looked at analysis e, of what the stresses are in the particular seal, it's almost the worst case is when we cycle it. Uh, we cycle it open and then closed. That's where we think, you know, when the leak rate increased, we think whatever the defect is in the seal, we were 
exacerbating that defect and, and making that grow a little bit, whether it be a little crack or a little imperfection in the side of the seal. Um, with this kind of pressure, it doesn't take a very, a very big defect to get this, these kind of leak rates. Um, and so we think it's stable. That's why we think it'll be fine during ascent and the rest of the flight. And we also, on the other side of it, we looked at, well, what if it grows? Can we manage it? And that's what is giving us confidence to proceed into the flight. They basically figured out what the leak rate would be if there was no O-ring in there. And even, which is like a hundred, Rocket Guy, you said it right. I'm going to paraphrase you here for a second. They, they tested, they, they did some testing on it to see what the leak rate would be with no seal in there, just metal on metal contact, which would cause an insane leak. You need O-rings in this stuff to seal up, right? That's a hundred times worse than the leak that they're seeing. So we're talking like a thousand PSI a minute leak. And even a thousand psi psi a minute leak in that line is acceptable. That's how much of a pain in the butt it would be to send this capsule back and take it apart. Now I know that seems like well they're just gonna you know that seems backwards, but they understand the configuration and the configuration of that thruster is stable. That was an important thing. That's why I keep pointing at the camera. I'm trying to li listen to that part. Steve said it was stable, meaning they understand where and how it's leaking. In that particular case, because that behavior is well understood, taking it apart, putting it back together, now you don't know what that thing's going to do. It might, it might leak again. What if it does? What if it's a defective seal? What if it's a defective pipe? What if that leak is somewhere else? The fact that they understand how and why and where it's leaking makes it safer, even though it's a leak and that's ideally not what you want. Weird, right? Ballistic assessment, as Poison said, all things considered. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stop poking you. Poke you all I freaking want to. Hey, Chief. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next up is Elizabeth Howell with Space.com. Hi, everybody. Thanks for your time. This probably is for Dana. Can you explain how long we can hold that port open for Starliner if the delay persists beyond, say, early June? What sorts of factors you might have also in terms of spacewalking and other activities that might influence future launch dates? Thank you. Sure. Let's see. Um... Hold on one second. What's up? Oh, uh, yeah. Give me one second. Here. I'll be right back. We're pretty flexible all through the summer. Currently, we're planning the spacewalks on uh, targeting June 13th. As the start of the first one, we'll keep them about a week apart. Um, but we have flexibility, so there's no specific driver for exactly when we do them. Um, we can do the spacewalks while Butch and Sunny are on board. We'll stay away from things like docking, undocking, and major handover days, but we've got flexibility in terms of where we put them. Um, we've got a Northrop Grumman flight planned for August. That's a berthing vehicle, so that's also not an impact to us, so other than actually deconflicting the specific birthing oh, day, ran out of gas. docking day, which is just a really small cutout. That's not an issue. In fact, the extra helping hands on board could be helpful with that kind of a cargo mission. So really, the, the next activity that we have would be our next crew exchange. Yeah, that's um, exactly. Out in the August time frame. That's the next time the docking's moving. And, of course, those are things we can adjust to if we needed. So we're pretty open and, and flexible yep. on the station and can move things around. They're talking about timelines for capsules going, the manifest for going to and from the ISS. Yeah, there's, it, it's called cutout windows and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's no big deal. Thanks, Dana. Uh, next up, we have Andrea yeah, Ricardo from the Houston Chronicle. For sure. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to find a very high-level way to describe this deorbit redundancy um, for our readers. Um, Steve. There's more than one thruster. That's it. You, you wanted a high level one? There's multiple pressure systems, isolated helium control systems for each valve, and that's going through a thruster block controller. The low level weight, there's multiple thrusters. More than one thruster that do the same thing. It's, it's directional fault redundancy. Sure. I don't know what HSR is, Dax. I'm Dax. I'm not sure what you're talking about. But the high level way is that they, the, the heli, they, they're able. To, so we know from their fault tree analysis that they talked about that they're able to isolate helium valves because they can isolate redundant helium valves. You just shut that thruster off. Just switch the valve off in the block controller. No problem. That's probably what they're gonna do. Just saying. The hot staging ring. 
I've heard that the HSR, that this heat hot staging ring will lower the center of mass position it was supposed to, to where it was supposed to be in, and that's why they lost control with the grid fins. They weren't made for that center of mass positioning it had after getting additional tons thanks to the hot staging ring. I don't think it would throw the center of mass off too bad, dude. I, I would say that it's a control problem with the gimbal thrusters. There's no way that, even if that hot staging ring weighs like two to three tons, right? Let's say it weighs five tons. How much mass is 33 Raptors? I don't think it would throw the center of mass forward enough to throw to, to throw off the moment control from the gimbal. I, I think that IFT3 landing was a avionics thing. It was a parameter a control parameters issue. The grid fins were gimbal locking. Yeah, there was there was a there was a avionics loss of control that we saw one of the thrusters stick. Or one of the grid fins stick. It stayed like that. That that's loss of control. That could be induced from a differential center of mass. Could be. I would say that's more likely a control systems parameter, conservative parameters, because you've never landed a super heavy before. I don't think the hot staging ring is hot staging ring is enough to throw off the center of mass that induced control of the grid fins will be. Control of the grid fins would induce a loss, uh, uh, you know, a loss of control. They would gimbal lock. I don't think it's, a, I think that's much more a flight parameter system. Like that's, that's the brains, that's the computers, not, not so much the mechanical design of the booster, but I could be wrong. That's just me speaking from my gut. I, Dax, one thing I try to do is I try, I, dude, I know plenty of people that work at SpaceX. I know plenty of people. I could get the, I could probably get the information if I really wanted to, but I don't. I like using my analysis and judgment to analyze the situation. I like using my analysis to analyze. Oh, great choice of words there, Skip. No, uh, I like using... I, I use this as a logic exercise for me to understand where, where SpaceX mentality is at. That's why, you know, me saying that I don't think it's going to throw off the moment is come, stems from an understanding of physics and analysis, like what we're... What we're what, like what I'm teaching you guys here with this teleconference, right? I could be wrong. It, I don't think it's enough to throw off the center of mass that the moment of control, the control moment that's induced from the grid fins moving is enough to lock them and just not be effective. I really don't think so. If I call it correctly, Raptor 2 is 1.4 tons from what's public. Okay, 33 times 1.4. That's way bigger than a 5-ton staging ring. And I doubt that that staging ring weighs 5 tons. Not even, I really don't think so. I know you're just saying that's what you heard. Yeah, 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 that's fair, that's fair. Anyway, back to this. So you have a variety okay, Eric, of structure combinations it. that can be used to ignite the engines and leave Earth's orbit to come home. You identified a very unlikely scenario where certain thrusters could go out and you didn't have a way to come home safely, but you've since found a solution. Is that like a fair way to say what's going on here? Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly exactly the way we would say it. We, we have a lot of redundancy uh, to, to, to come home. And uh, like I, we said, we have a four OMAC option, which uh, and redundancy on those those thrusters. If you just look at the number of thrusters we could use, there's redundancy there in each of the doghouses. Um, a two OMAC option, and it's really only a very narrow case that you could get into where the normal backup, the third backup option, which is the um, or the second backup option is the RCS thrusters, which we normally use eight of those. Now instead of having to use eight, we would use four. Did I answer your question? Hopefully. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. And thanks, Steve. Uh, next up in the queue is- Can I hear that question again? Sorry, I just- Is that like a fair way to say what's going on here? The very technical station and can move things around, helping hands on board. Hi, um, I'm, I'm still trying to find a very high-level way to describe this deorbit redundancy um, for our readers. Um, Steve, is this, is this the gist? So you have a variety of thruster combinations that can be used to ignite the engines and leave Earth's orbit to come home. 
you identified a very unlikely scenario where certain thrusters could go out and you didn't have a way to come home safely, but you've since found a solution. It, is that like a fair way to say what's going on here? Thank you. Um, Steve, is this, is this the gist? So you have a variety of thruster combinations that can be used to ignite the engines and leave Earth's orbit to come home. You identified a very unlikely scenario where certain thrusters could go out and you didn't have a way to come home safely, but you've since found a solution. It, is that like a fair way to say what's going on here? Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think that's enough. exactly exactly the way we would say it. We, we have a lot of redundancy uh, to, to, to come home. And uh, like I, we said, we have uh, a, a four... OMAC option, the the hot which, uh, and redundancy on both those thrusters. If you just look at the number of thrusters we could use, there's redundancy there in each of the doghouses. Um, a two OMAC option, and it's really only a very narrow case that you could get into where the normal backup, the third backup option, which is the, um, or the second backup option is the RCS thrusters, which we normally use eight of those. Now, instead of having to use eight, we would use four. Did I answer your question? Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, she described it, I guess, in a fair way. The the, the low-level answer is that there's other thrusters. The high-level answer is that they have the ability to isolate thruster control, thruster control actuation with those helium valve control, with the helium... Uh... Here, I can show you a picture. The picture is probably better. Where is it? Did I X out of it? Here, let me control shift D. Yeah, there we go. This is the one. Like I said, I'm not a rocket scientist, but if I'm looking and if I'm looking at this and understanding it correctly, that looks like an actuation block right there. So how many thrusters do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, there's ten. There's another one right there. So we got six lines going out right there, and clearly there's this is a block with with a bunch of there's electronic solenoids actuating the pneumatic solenoids here, from what I can tell. And then you could have an input that seems to be going out the other side too. two more on the side too these right here might not be helium actuation those could be fuel lines but it's it's hard enough to it's hard to tell but yeah there is other ones on the sides right there long story short that looks like you that looks like your your valve actuation control block once again huge guess huge guess because yeah actually yeah there we go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve there you go Six sides here, six sides there. Boom. That's most likely the, the actuation control block. What else would it be? Right? There you go. See? There's six on this side, six on that side. Yep. Two on the side. Roll control. It's 12. They can isolate the system. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to tell you. And that's good redundancy. That's good, that's good design, guys. I got... Sorry. It's good design. People can hate on Starliner all they want. That's smart. That's a smart way to do that. Especially if you're opting for a pneumatic control system. My question here in this regard would be why didn't you why why are you why are you using pneumatically controlled valves instead of electronically controlled valves? Electronically controlled valves would save you a ton of mass in this design. But see, I'll answer my own question. All right. I'll, I'll answer the own, my own question just by doing a little logic exercise. So why are they doing it that way? What are they trying to do? They're trying to use thrusters. All right, we know that. Why would helium actuation be a constraint here? Let's think about the context of these thrusters. Did Boeing design these thrusters? Nope. Rockwell did. They're shuttle thrusters. They're probably carrying over a legacy system that's been upgraded, which is why, because if you cast your mind back to the 70s, you know, when the shuttle was designed, when these thrusters were designed, right? Elect full electronic control and electronic actuation of thrusters was not a thing. You'd be, you'd be it'd be a lot safer to use a pneumatic to use a pneumatic system, a mechanical system instead of an electronic one. My guess, to answer my own question, is that they because propulsion research is expensive, and these are reusing 
They're not the actual shuttle thrusters. They're new ones, but it's the same design. They're reusing legacy designs here to, to save on research and development, which is fair. That's a, that's a fair thing to do. And because of this, you, you're using a pneumatic actuated system instead of an electronic one. Now, SpaceX on the Draco thrusters, those are electronically actuated solenoids. They look like fuel injectors. SpaceX, there's plenty of pictures around a Draco engine. It's very simple, very simple design. But SpaceX did all their propulsion research themselves. People can hate on Starliner. That's smart is how I'm going to hear that quote. Yeah, hey, whatever. Yeah, yeah. If you want to paraphrase me, you're gonna do me like you're gonna do me like that. You're gonna do a press on me, scary. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that's not a bad way to do it. If your design constraint is reusing thrusters, because designing a thruster block is not nearly as complicated. Designing a, a controller block like this is not nearly as complicated as redesigning the entire freaking thruster. Fun fact. I wonder how much time they how much time they saved in qualifying them for flights since some percentage of thruster design was already qualified and known and probably just used as is, like the valves, for instance. They probably saved a lot of time, Rocket Guy. And a lot less voltage and current, for sure, James. Yeah. I mean, you you know, you have helium, which is very low mass. <laughs> the electronic system actually might end up being more mass be, despite being a lot simpler, right? You're going to need a lot more relays, right? Unless you design your architecture around a voltage, which I'm pretty sure that's what SpaceX did because they clean, they clean, they clean slated the entire Dragon design. It's, it's not really based off of anything. It's based off of research programs that are being done in the past, like NASA did a research program for the heat shield that would ultimately become dragons. SpaceX borrowed a bunch of like half completed research projects and used that to pipe together, put together a capsule in 20, 2008, 2009, and 2010. And they've been iterating off that clean ish sheet design since. Use what you know. That's See, that's what I mean. Sometimes it's better to use, even use a system from the 70s because you know it. You understand it. Because it's hard It's hard to develop new systems and understand them. Look at SpaceX with the Dragon capsule. Look at the DM-1 capsule. It popped on the test stand. Because of inexperience. Because SpaceX had never done that before. Then nobody's ever used an integrated hypergolic propulsion system in their capsule for launch escapes. No one's ever done that. Right? So you... You know, you're going to run into teething problems. Every spacecraft does. Every single one of them. Without That's the one thing that you can be absolutely sure about. That's something that you don't understand is going to happen like this. And that's what, that's what they said at the beginning. They said that at the beginning of this press conference. Anyway, let's finish this up. When did that capsule explode? I think it was 2019, but I'm not sure. Yeah, Tessa, there you go. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks, Steve. Uh, next up in the queue is for sure, Rocket. Um, Ahmed from the AFP. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, just a couple of parts. Yeah, there you go, check. Ricardo. For um, sure. My understanding is correct. You'll monitor the leak in the pre-launch period, and then um, Starliner will fly uh, dock with station, and it'll you'll you'll check on the leak again then. And the second thing no. was just for context, how no. common or uncommon is it to... Um, fly a uh, crewed spaceship when a leak is identified um, as, as Oh, nice, present. Okay, There you uh, go. Thank you. Yeah, again, we'll, we'll once we um, activate the propulsion system, um, we'll be able to, to take a look at, uh, we'll use the repress cycles in the helium system to, uh, to take a look at the, the size of the leak, and we can do that once we pressurize out at the launch pad for flight. That happens about four and a half hours prior to launch, and then we'll watch it. Uh, it takes about an hour for things to stabilize um, in the system, and then we can we can take a look there. We'll get another look at it, as you said, after we dock, and then we can see what the pressure decay rates are and compare that to what we did back in the VIF. And then, you know, we have flown uh, vehicles with small helium leaks. We've flown the space shuttle uh, with a few regulators uh, in that ohms and RCS system uh, that were leaking, um, and we've we've had a couple of uh. cases with Dragon where we've had a few small leaks as well. So. Oh wait 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 what was that last part? Wait 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 Steve rewind hold on hold on what was that last part? What was that last part? Wait 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 w
wait, 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 wait. That homes and RCS system uh, that we're leaking, um, and we've we've had a couple of cases with Dragon where we've had a few small leaks as well. So. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that really gets the noggin jogging. This happens all the time, guys. It's a low level risk. It happens to everything. It's a pain. The helium's a pain in the butt to move around, guys. It's so tiny. So small. So small. Example of a licensable NASA tech. See what I mean? This stuff happens. It's just, uh, you know what? Like, uh, you know, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I appreciate Boeing being super transparent about this. I mean, I think NASA's kind of holding their feet to the fire, but hey, whatever. Whatever. This is cool. Them being transparent about this is a great opportunity for us to understand. This is the best stuff. Uh, from them being super transparent about this to learn about fault tree analysis, risk ad risk aversion, risk assessment, this is all super important stuff if you want to work in the spaceflight industry. This is super important stuff to learn, and it takes a long time, but these are the best lessons for it. The best lessons for it. Nothing even comes close. Oh, that didn't take long. What, what is this? How deaf can you be? Come on, man. Yeah, Ricardo, flight four date looks to be okay. Like, see here, the way the the in it and forgive me for presuming. I can't. It's hard to it's hard to figure out tone from text here, but you know, oh, if you're keeping score at home, so implying the the implication there is that you're comparing it to drag. Okay. The problems that Boeing has found with Starliner spacecraft on the ground since OFT2. Prop system valve, slammable tape, parachutes, helium leak, prop system design vul vulnerability. Crew flight test now set for June 1st. The implication here is that Starliner has all these problems and they might, they're probably going to encounter more problems on orbit. Right? That's the implication from that statement. If you guys think I'm presuming too much, you let me know. The implication is that Starliner bad, Dragon good, right? That That's the problem. But yet, we just heard Steve Stitch in the press conference say that every spacecraft has had this problem, Dragon included. See what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to dump on Eric. He's fine. Like, I get it. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like Dragon and SpaceX ain't eating Boeing's lunch when it comes to launching people into space. Oh, they absolutely are. Oh, yeah. Boeing promised Boeing, Boeing, us, Boeing promised us crewed space flights in space days like 2017 or 2018. Yeah, you're about six years late. Better late than never, I guess. I, I get it. I understand. But also, to imply that finding problems on the ground is a bad thing is kind of ridiculous. That's... Dude, what do you... What? Oh, these are the problems they had on the ground. You know, what What other problems are they going to have in space? Like, would you rather them find these problems in space? I don't understand. Yeah, remember capturing the flag? Yeah, exactly. The Boeing, Boeing guy said we're going to get that flag. Oops. Yeah, that, yeah, that statement held up real good. Are you going to read the Flight 3 update later? Sure, Nidoto. Yeah, we can do that. You know, like, this, there's a weird thing going on here. Like, people people want to make it seem like, oh, it's SpaceX versus Boeing. I really don't think we can afford, as spaceflight fans, to take sides at this point in time. I don't think that's smart. This ain't Ford versus Chevy, okay? Spaceflight indices of the spaceflight industry, especially the commercial industry, is a very fragile ego, ecosystem right now. It, it, it's not... It, 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 dude, if you look at history, the commercial market for spaceflight has collapsed several times because it's rather, it's a rather volatile and unstable industry just due to the nature of what they're doing. Collapsed in the early 60s. True story. Collapsed in the 90s with the dot-com bubble. This happens. 
I don't think, like, look, I don't think the, that the space flight economic ecosystem is robust enough to take sides. I think that's really stupid. That is a really stupid thing to do right now. You're allowing, taking sides right now is basically, <sighs> taking sides saying SpaceX is better, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I ain't a SpaceX fanboy like everybody else. If anything, I want Boeing to be more like SpaceX. They should, come on guys, you said you were going to launch six years ago. What, what are you doing? What's going on? Like, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and just bury my head in the sand, right? But also at the same time, People that are people that seem to imply that it's SpaceX versus Boeing, or seem to imply some tribalism when it comes to space flight here, that's really stupid. That's a really stupid thing to do right now. You're arguing for a monopoly. You're, so you're you're arguing for SpaceX to just do everything, and that's fair. Like, dude, I get it. Their results speak for themselves. I understand, but I I honestly think that's a very bad idea. You're arguing for a monopoly in the commercial industry. That, you understand, that is not growth, that is degrowth, that is consolidation of a, of a burgeoning commercial industry. You're pruning the hedge before it's fully grown. That's really stupid. That's a really stupid thing to do. That's not smart at all. You're choking off the industry by taking sides right now. That's really stupid. I, I just I really don't think that's a good idea. That's purely my opinion, you can disagree with it, totally cool. Notice how he didn't do a score for Dragon. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I don't get what the point of that statement is, other than to, to drive some kind of, some type of ideological thing that SpaceX is better than everybody else. And you know what, man? Like, here's the thing. He's not wrong. I don't think he's, I don't think it's wrong. SpaceX is doing things that, they were they, with Dragon that they're dreaming about. You know, like. Uh, you know, Dragon is going to fly on Polaris Dawn, mimicking, you know, with, with Isaacman, with Jared Isaacman, which is awesome. I'm super psyched for that mission. It's going to be amazing, right? That's going to be super freaking cool. Boeing would, you know, they wish they were doing that with Starliner right now. They're just trying to get to the ISS right now. And that's, you know, but once again, you know, I see people make this mistake all the time. You're going to say, oh, defund them. Oh, defund them. Oh, defund them. Just have SpaceX do everything. Just have SpaceX do everything. Just have SpaceX do everything. Okay, so one, that's never happening. I will tell you that right now. The Department of Defense, NASA, any government agency will never, ever rely on one system's architecture to get into orbit. They tried that once in the 80s. It didn't work. Bad idea. Never going to happen. Ever until the ecosystem is healthy enough to take sides a strong robust economic system like basically to the point where the capsules are here to stay and the, the star starliner and dragon are here to stay and there's no there's no possibility of the market contracting okay only then is when you when i think it's wise to take sides and be like oh yeah brand loyalty etc cetera, etc cetera, right that's fair How about Dream Chasers? Sierra Space is even more opportunity to compete with Starliner. Y yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. And taking sides right now, Crafty, is going to squander that opportunity for a, the market to grow. You're you're arguing for degrowth here by taking sides. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's like, why would you do that? I don't think people realize how fragile all this stuff is. Look, man. I've said this once, I'll say it again. I've said this many times on stream, all right? Like, all joking aside, I know we have a good time here. Look, man, I was a space flight fan in the late 2000s, going into the early 20 teens. You get what I'm trying to say. Like, 2008 to 2010, all right? I've been a space flight fan for a very long time. And I get it, there's some people here that are space flight, that, that are here for the around for the Apollo program. And, and man, I am forever jealous if you got to see a Saturn V launch, okay? <laughs> now, with that being said, I was a fan through the... I've been a Spaceflight fan for like 20 years at least, right? And, and don't get me wrong, it's not about tenure. What I'm trying to explain is that I've, I saw Columbia explode. Saw that. I, I've, I was there. Not there, like I watched it on the news, right? But you see it. Seen what it's like to have crew failures affect NASA's goals, right? I've also seen what it's like 
to have the rug pulled out of the entire space flight industry because that's what happened after the Great Recession. They tried to pull the plug on NASA completely. That's the reason why we have SLS, because the congressman said, frick you, that's not happening. Why you're trying to pull the plug on all of our jobs? What are you, nuts? Are you absolutely crazy surrendering our aerospace capability and relying on a commercial market that doesn't exist? Operative word. Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan gave talks. They testified to Congress about the volatility, volatility of the industry and how it's dangerous to rely on a commercial company that hadn't launched anything into space at the time. This was back in 2008, 2009. They've launched one, payload, one small sat payload into space, a, a, a tech demonstrator for the Air Force. Why that's a very bad idea? Because the commercial industry is very volatile. Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan had lived through the dot-com bubble collapsing and destroying the commercial launch industry in the 90s. And even before that, consolidation of NASA, right? When NASA was first formed, 58, 59, 60, 61, into 62. When NASA was formed, it killed the commercial satellite launch industry. Not a lot of people know this. It killed it. Look up when the first the first commercial communication satellite, Telstar 1. Look at when that launched into orbit. It's weird how we didn't see much after that until the 80s. Funny. Curious. Yes, provocative. Read about it. It's important. The commercial industry is still super volatile. And I remember a time where we almost had nothing. Nothing. Don't take sides right now. That's stupid. That is really stupid. You're anybody that's taking side, oh, all SpaceX, Boeing's a bunch of clowns, SLS sucks, blah, blah, blah. Anybody that's doing that kind of crap, you're arguing for degrowth. You're arguing for consolidation of the industry. And I get, I think there's legitimate arguments with SLS. Please, please launch more. For the love of Christ, that thing is expensive. Launch more. What the hell are you guys doing? SLS was supposed to send people, uh, Artemis 1 was supposed to be in 2017. You missed the mark by five years. What the what the actual frick are you guys doing over there? Can anybody here predict a realistic bu budget timeline? Anyone? Any anyone? Like, it's not above criticism. But arguing for those programs to go away is, all, is arguing inadvertently for consolidation of the spaceflight industry. Getting rid of SLS is not just getting rid of a rocket. It's getting rid of a ton of commercial providers that provide parts for it. Maybe some of those commercial providers fold because SLS goes under. And maybe some of those commercial providers also provide valves, electronics, controllers to SpaceX and Boeing. That would, have, that would be a catastrophic implosion, even though it's a government rocket. Discovery. It would be Go a catastrophic up. ripple effect through the commercial market. That's really stupid. That would be a really stupid thing to do. SLS is carrying a heavy price tag, no doubt. And that's not above criticism. Absolutely not. Seriously, a billion dollars for one launch. If you launch it more, probably would go down. But a billion Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, guys? That's the best you can come up with? Come on! However, getting rid of that will cause a catastrophic ripple effect through the commercial market. That's, that's not good. That wouldn't be good. That wouldn't be good. Getting rid of SLS gives, gives the HLS program no purpose. That's less money for SpaceX. Do we really want that? And for, for the idealistic people out there that say, oh, well, they should just pull funding from SLS and give it to SpaceX. Oh, yeah, because that happens all the time in government programs, right? Fiscal responsibility happens all the time. Oh. Oh, no. Yeah. I tip my cap to your idealism. Pulls with the prime sub. Thank you very much. See, that's what I mean. That is the stupidest thing you could do right now. This is stupid. It's so stupid. Oh, my God. How can you be so tone deaf? I don't get it. Yeah, all that institutional knowledge from the shuttle program got flushed down the toilet. But do you guys know the day after STS-135 landed? 5,000. 5,000 people on the space coast lost their job that's 5000 less jobs for the space program and because they tried to they canceled constellation and pulled the rug out from nasa you lost even more institutional knowledge we wonder why it's taken so long discovery ridiculous you lost all the people that put the stupid thing together and then you tried to build a vehicle based off of the vehicle that all those people had jobs for putting together and then had trouble putting it together weird how that works
Shocked Pikachu face, bro. Oh, it drives me up the freaking wall, dude. I get so pissed at this stuff, dude. I get so mad. Oh, what are you doing? Stop it. Stop that. What are you doing? What's up, Nas Wolf? I'm doing all right, dude. I'm good. I, th I think I just got to take some blood pressure medication. Breathe. Where's the bag? You know? I am disappointed. And if it's one thing I do not like to be, that is to be disappointed. <laughs> Someone clipped that. <laughs> it was a bag, blood fam. Get your mind out of the gutter, you dirty. <clears throat> anyway. Stop ranting. You have the flame trench to do it again soon. Oh, I'm gonna, Hellzeekin. Don't get me wrong. This is just a dress rehearsal. I'm gonna go the frick off if they let me. I'm gonna go off. <laughs> right, a bag. <clears throat> anyway, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. That was the Starliner press conference. I don't feel like listening to the rest of it. I really don't feel like listening to the rest of that. Ah, want to play Fallout? Don't forget, we have the Flame Trench in about three hours. Yeah, for the love of all things holy, please go out. Oh, I will. We also have Friday Night Racing tonight. I, I can't do Friday Night Racing tonight, Nova. My in-laws are here. I already feel bad that they're sitting in the house doing nothing and I'm working. That's not, that's not, that's not cool. You'll, you'll understand. You know, if, you know, if you want, A, if you want that, and B, if you do want that, when you get to that point, you don't, you don't do that stuff, so. Well, the more reason to do Friday Night Racing, I actually like hanging out with my in-laws, to be honest with you. Primo's family is all from Detroit, so just kind of, it's kind of law that they like automobiles. I, too, like automobiles, so, yeah, I actually, I actually, I would hope I'm on their good graces. I might not be, but Maybe. Do you still dream of Chernobyl? I want to know. Yes. Jens, I want to go back to workers and resources eventually, dude. I too, pocket guy. Mower update. I heard the mower drive into my mower storage, which is through that wall right there. So I, I would assume my lawn is... I would assume my lawn's all nice and cut good, boy. Want to discuss Shadow Zone's reporting? Sorry to bring it up it's been, if it's been discussed. Uh, I haven't, I haven't watched it yet. Yeah. Oh, jocular mowing antics. Yes. <laughs> Tell the in-laws I said, hey, we'll do. We'll do. Um, if you guys wanted to talk about Shadow Zone's video, I haven't watched it yet. I only saw the thumbnail for it on Twitter. Twixer, Xer, Mixer. Mixer? You guys remember Mixer? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I know. That was the punchline. That was a joke. Are you laughing? Yeah, all right. <laughs> How would I submit a question to the Flame Trench? Uh, what's your question, John? I mean, I mean, you could. I, I, there's a way to do it. You have to tag at NASA Space Flight, I think. And yes, I did actually laugh. TLDR, Shadow Zone revealed that Take Two did the exact same crap that NASA did with Axon Constellation, but with KSP2. I'd have to watch the video, Nova. I'd I'd have to I'd have to go and watch it. I don't I haven't asked Shadow Zone if I could want, react to his video. I'd have to go shoot him a DM. Um, I need more context to that statement. Yeah, where is he? Where is he getting his info from? Because guys, I'll be honest with you. I, I am. I'm just trying to sit back and figure out what the heck's going on, dude. I haven't weighed in on this at all, and I, I don't want to right now. I don't think it's wise to do that. He's got a lot of sources. Okay.
<laughs> Nice. Nice. Wondering how many flights the folks think Starship needs to hit before it would re won't require a special license like a commercial airliner. Oh, um, okay, Stuart, railroader. Yep, yep. Um, someone who worked on KSP two. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I know those same people, Erudite. And until I hear what he has, to, what Shadow has to say, I can't say whether I agree or disagree. You know. I know a lot of the KSP developers. Yeah, very, I'm a, I have very good relationships with a lot of them. But anyway, so John, your question. How many flights does Starship need to hit before it won't require a special license? That's a really good question. Um, so guys, the reason why the FAA has been kind of a, it's, okay, so, all right, John, let's, uh, let's, let's discuss some points here real quick. I'll change up the title here to the Space and Rocket review. Let me change it up. I got to change it up on both streams. Um, okay, so here's the thing. It, it seems like the FAA is holding up SpaceX something fierce, doesn't it? It very much does. And to an extent, I'm not going to say that that's not what's going on. But once again, we got to understand. It's important to understand why. Okay. So why is the FAA? Why? Mishap report? Another freaking mishap report? You're screwing with SpaceX's rapid iterative testing. You see, you, this is ridiculous. Why are you doing it? What, what the hell, guys? Like, come on. They launched all those test flights like this one right here in rapid decision. They didn't need a mishap report every freaking time. Right? So why is why all why all these problems now? Well, okay. 2018, 2019, 2020. As part of Space Policy Directive 3, which was an executive order that was signed by the president at the time. It's not a bad piece of legislation, okay? That basically made the FAA your one-stop shop for certifying A, a commercial launch site, and B, a commercial launch vehicle. Okay? Why? Why would you do this? Because before you had to go to NASA, you had to go to the NOAA, you had to go to the FCC for communications, rockets have antennas, you had to go, you had to go to the FAA in some way, shape, or form. All right. You had to go to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Environmental Protection Agency, and state and county officials wherever you're trying to build your spaceport. The government actually doing something useful for a change recognized that if they want to bolster the commercial market, they need to start treating rockets because the high frequency of launches is going to happen because the commercial market is expanding, right? Just like what we were talking about a second ago, right? Commercial market is expanding like crazy. Well, with every expansion comes, comes a contraction. Okay. It, that's, that happens. It's going to happen eventually. You know, there's going to be ups and downs in any economic system that it has elast. But how uh, how much elasticity it has it depends. I don't personally like what we were saying before. I don't think there's enough elasticity in the commercial space flight economy to pick sides. That's stupid. We won't rebound from a contraction. Historically, that's accurate. Every time. That's why ULA exists, because the commercial market imploded in the in the, the early 2000s but that's another story now so the government realized the, that the, they wanted to leverage the commercial industry and expand this new economic sector so they made it so instead of having to go to all those different three-letter agencies you go to the faa and the faa is what communicates with those agencies they're the intermediary because they wanted to start treating that's the way that airports and airplanes are certified they wanted to start treating spacecraft like airplanes Spacecraft launching is not going to be something that requires a notice to air missions. It's just going to, they want, they want rocket launches to jive with commercial, the commercial airline industry. Just treat it like another vehicle flying. It's just another aircraft flying up into space, unrestricted launch corridor, unrestricted climb, right? You know, so in, in imposing a notice to airmen, right? A notice to marine traffic, all this other stuff that you have to do to you know to get a launch on the books well if you're launching every week that's a very inefficient system okay 
that system, that regulatory framework is really only designed for maybe one launch a month at the very best. There was a, there's a need to consolidate it because the industry is expanding, right? Not deregulate, consolidate and make one-stop shop to optimize flow. You're not deregulating anything. Okay. Now, so SpaceX has to go to the FAA. That kind of started 2019, 2020, right around when they landed SN15, give or take. Now, with that being said, actually started a little bit before that with the launch licensing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with that being said, the reason why we get a lot of downtime between these flights and why we get mishap investigations is because the FAA, the FAA is not just looking to certify Starship. They're, it, they're not just looking to do that, okay? They're not just looking to certify Starship. And anybody that seems to imply that the FAA is holding up SpaceX for some kind of ulterior motive is stupid. That's dumb. Um, what they're doing, okay, is, well, what does the FAA know about making new launch sites? What does anyone know about making new launch sites? When's the last time we built a new launch pad before something like Boca Chica came along? Up until now, the framework has been to just reuse a pad that we built during the Cold War to launch ICBMs. Slick 40, or, or government satellites to payload. Slick 40, Slick 41, 39A. You get the idea. There's, there's no framework for developing a commercial space flight launch facility, basically a commercial spaceport. There's no regulatory framework for that. Does there need to be regulatory framework? Well, anything that flies in the air should probably have something so we don't have a rocket crashing into an airplane. Rockets hitting airplanes are not rockets. Those are called missiles. Yep, don't want that, right? So the reason why this is taking so long is because as the FAA is qualifying Starship for flight, a, the FAA is learning on, on how to do it. What do they know about spaceships? But spaceships are close to airplanes, so it's, logic, it's a logical jump. Here's the most important part, the spaceport. The FAA is moving to certify commercial spaceports like anyone could certify a commercial airport. That is huge. That could, that could allow anyone to build a launch site pretty much anywhere as long as you get FAA approval. We could see spaceports pop up like, like airports pop it up like weeds but since this is the first time they're going through it the faa needs time to learn and i would argue that starship is the best vehicle to learn this with right because you have to take into account full reuse right you have to take into account turnaround time you have to take into account the environmental impact of launching as much as a jetliner something the faa knows a ton about right that's really smart it's a really good way of doing things i don't necessarily mind that it's taking a long time between mishap reports I think that's really smart. See, that's that's why it's taking so long between flights, because the FAA is figuring out what it takes to make a commercial launch site, make the regulatory framework for certifying a commercial launch site, a commercial launch site work like registering a commercial airport. Small airport, fixed base operations, stuff like that. They're figuring out how that all fits together. And I would argue that Starship is the best vehicle to do it with. Now, the downside of that is that SpaceX does get held up a little bit. I'm pretty sure if there was no FAA mishap report, Flight 4 would already be in the ocean. And that does suck. But you got to understand, this doesn't just work for SpaceX, right? It, it, I mean, this doesn't just work for Boca Chica. If SpaceX wants to build more Starship pads in the future. Well, now we know how to do that. Now we know what's needed to build a Starship pad. Now we know what's needed to make a commercial spaceport. Maybe SpaceX wants to do oil rigs in the future. They've talked about that before. That'd be really easy to get FAA approval for that because they already know. They already tested it at Boca Chica. Anybody else, maybe they want to, maybe you're a rocket lab or something or, you know, relativity and you want to do a commercial spaceport, you know, somewhere that's not a pre existing space launch area, right? So you want to do that, right? The regulatory framework and precedent there and say you're even launching an expendable vehicle it should be easy to get this all certified in the future probably about as hard as registering an airport on faa maps 
It's smart when you think about it. It's a, it is hedging your bets for long-term commercial vi the long-term commercial spaceflight economic viability. I think that's really smart. That's a really good way of doing things. Really, really, really well thought out. It's very rare that you get such lucidity from from the government and such uh like a decision like that has very, very long-term effectiveness, right? That that's really smart. That's a really good way of doing things. Do you guys wanna you guys wanna be able to get on a rocket and go take a vacation in low Earth orbit for a week in the future? This is the start of being able to do that. This is exactly what happened with the commercial airline industry after World War II. Same stuff. Actually, it was easier because all the all the airports that they made for all the planes that we made for World War II. So it's really easy to just hop into a commercial airline industry from a commercial from a commercial government bombing the bomber provider, right? Doing this now will be able to leverage in the future people building spaceports in your backyard. Not not in your backyard, but obviously environmental impact, you know, I get it. Like, not in your backyard, but dude, we can see spaceports in every city, just like in airports in every city. Wouldn't that be something? Maybe point-to-point -point hops. You never know. This, this opens up the door for that. So, us waiting a couple extra months between Starship flights doesn't really bother me in the grand scheme of things. Because that means in the future, we might be able to get these daily Starship flight that, flights that Elon is talking about. And I think that I think that they're working together. To be a hundred percent honest with you, I think they're working together. I think the FAA and SpaceX are in cahoots. I don't think the FAA is intentionally hampering SpaceX. I think SpaceX is helping the FAA write the book on what it takes to make a commercial spaceport. And I think having SpaceX do that, uh, I would prefer that out of any other company. Can you imagine if both, like, uh, you know what I was going to say? Can you imagine if there was another commercial launch provider doing this? There's no way this would get done nearly as fast. Think about it. Right? B-29 got turned into an airliner. There you go, Hellfish. You know, it's, you know, Starship, we know, has feasibility studies with the United States Transportation Command. Starship is a cargo hauler, right? At least the government is looking at Starship for cargo hauling applications. Guess what? Guess what? The resupply vehicles to support the war effort in World War II also made sure that Germany didn't get taken over by communist filth. The Berlin airlift. Where do you think we got all those freaking planes from? And they were serving a civilian resupply purpose. And that paved the way to the airline industry. Read about the Berlin airlift, guys. Everyone in Germany knows that one. Very important. Germany would not be Germany today if it wasn't for the Berlin airlift in, in the late 40s. That was very important. The United States supplied an entire city, a multi-million population city. West Berlin. They supplied it via airplanes only. And it's because we had all those airplanes from, from government contracts. Because they were resupplying the war effort. So they went from moving guns to moving food. Smart. Easy pivot. Biggest logistical flex of all time, for real. We sustained an entire city, a multi-million person city with airplanes for 18 months. It's ridiculous when you think about it, but we did it. See what I mean? Just because Starship could be used to move tanks and airplanes around doesn't mean that it couldn't be used to shuttle you guys up into a low Earth orbit tourism flight in the future, because it absolutely would. I really think it would. And I think, John, that's why, that's why it took me a long time to, you know, that's why I had to explain all this out. That's why it was a good question. Because, yeah, it's taken a long time. A couple months between flights is nothing in the scheme of things for you and I to be able to take a vacation into the moon to the moon in, like, 20 years. That's sweet. Greetings from Germany. That's how you know. I'm sure they, I'm sure they taught you guys all about that, and if they didn't, I don't know what the hell your school system's doing. That's right, Evertech. Showed the Soviets. We ain't screwing around. We're not gonna allow you know, we're not, we're not gonna allow communist filth to take over more more of pristine Western Europe. The frick out, man. Hell yeah, am I right? Hell yeah. Back to back champions, that's right, bro. <laughs> 
Thanks, that was way more than I expected. It, it, sometimes these answers take longer, dude. What are you gonna do? Sometimes these answers take longer. What are you, what are you gonna do? All right. <clears throat> As I'm getting kind of hoarse, I'm gonna go refill my water bottle. Somebody linked me up. Unfortunately, Poland was not so lucky. I mean, Rafal, to, to put it very bluntly, and if you're watching with your children, just cover their ears for a second. Stalin was an asshole. Couldn't 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 bargain with that piece of shit. And we lost we lost an allied power because of it, and that pisses me off. But it's an asshole. What are you gonna do? Alright. We're good. I'm gonna go fill up my water bottle. Link me up. Link me up with the IFT3 mishap report. I wanna see it. Alrighty then. E, I want to know why our government is a freaking retirement home. What, wait, wait, Andrew, what are you talking about? We're talking about space flight, dude. I don't know. Uh, get what you vote for? I don't know. Vote different next time. All right. Not space, but Edison has finished the the conventional seating concept for the diesel electric truck. It looks very nice. Let's see. Oh, oh, baby. I like that, Thomas. I like that a lot. Side-by-side -side timelines for three and four. Cool, cool. Uh, Blood fam, I ain't touching that one, man. Oh, that's killer. I love it. I love it. Did you get vodka? No, it's just water, pigeon. Yep. Oh, simple. Oh, that's dude. Dude. I love it. I love it. It's just a truck. It's simple. Doesn't need to be complicated. And it looks fantastic. That's perfect, man. Truck should be utilitarian like that. That's awesome. I I really, really like it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have blood beam. Yeah, yeah. They will also offer it as a version with no e-axles to people 
to people who can drop in their own engines and make it a normal truck. How can one company be so incredibly based? Oh my god! Oh. Ooh, sorry. That is money! I love it. Make a long haul version. How many dollars is that? I don't know. I don't know. Thomas, do we know the price to... Every truck will comes with a come with a parts list so people can repair their own truck. Oh, stop. Stop. Stop it. Stop stop it. That truck is very hench and very jocular. Riglet, it is the most jocular of jocularity trucks. It's highest on the jocularity scale. <clears throat> it is hencherific. Hands, I don't need them, fellas. <laughs> It's joculistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that is sick, dude. So, okay, just on, on a quick side note, what that truck is, that's an Edison. So it, an Edison is an electric truck, but it's not just it's not just electric, it's a diesel electric. So you have a you have a diesel power plant, and then instead of the transmission being right there, like right behind it, you have a generator. The diesel is attached to a generator. The generator generates electrical power, charges batteries, and then electric motors drive the wheels like a locomotive. I don't know why someone hadn't done this in the past. Like someone hadn't lifted the systems off of a, off of a diesel locomotive and put this on a truck. But diesel electric hybrid, like I'm generally not really I don't really like hybrids I, I, in the past like I think it's better to go all EV or just stick with internal combustion but honestly this one I don't mind for a long haul truck hybrids make sense just like a hybrid we've been doing a hybrid system in trains for 50 years I don't know what for long haul heavy trucks I don't know why you wouldn't have done the same other insides stolen from a Tesla no it's how they used to build submarines. Yes, they, even before trains, Blood Vam, that's right. Submarines were diesel electric, like wouldn't test you boats. U boats. Balao class, Gato class, it's all diesel electric. They're all they're hybrids. I'm curious to what the efficiency is over a plain diesel truck. Uh, geek, it's like tenfold. The Porsche Tiger. Oh yeah, that thing that didn't pass accepted testing. I remember that. Uh, the efficiency is tenfold. You know why? You can scavenge energy. It uses regenerative braking, just, just, just like a diesel would, just like a diesel electric train. You have regenerative brakes, but a train puts the regenerative brakes through a resistance element. The regenerative brakes charge the battery here. You can use the kinetic energy of a truck going down the hill to recharge your battery. I don't know why anyone hasn't implemented a scavenging system here. Now, a scavenging system like that doesn't really make sense for a car. Like, even though Teslas do it, right? Teslas do that to increase range. That's fine. That's fair. But for the truck, it really makes sense. Use gravity pushing this truck down the hill to generate power. The truck is your battery. The truck is a kinetic battery in this, in this regard. Like, you have a truck at the top of a hill, right? A truck rolls down the hill. Instead of using the engine to, and the brakes, the brakes will just take your kinetic energy and convert it to heat. And that heat just goes off into the atmosphere, right? This thing has the electric motors engaged going down the hill and it generates power. That The alternating fields inside of this electric motor when it's rolling down is going to generate power and charge the battery. Charging the battery is going to basically put resistance on the generator and that's going to slow your truck down but it also generates power you're taking the kinetic energy of that truck and you're scavenging it and turning it into electrical energy no other truck does that teslas do it that's why tesla brake pads never fade because the electric motors are are doing that to recharge the battery this thing can do that but you also have a diesel engine to be able to pull you up the damn hill right but you can scavenge that power right back it's way more efficient dude way more efficient it like 
it kind of makes sense for a Tesla. Teslas do it to, once again. If you're doing all EV, it's it's done to increase range. But for a truck, it really makes sense, dude, because you paid you paid you paid in the fuel to get that stupid that stupid fifty three foot trailer that's full of stuff, fifty thousand pounds. You paid for that to get at the top of the hill. You can get almost all of that energy back. The only only stuff is the only energy that you're pretty much going to lose in this particular scenario gets lost due to the resistance in the wires. It's very smart. I'm telling you, man, this truck is super well thought out. And the guy, the guy that started Edison is a is a long haul logging trucker in British Columbia in Canada. The guy is like, what the hell am I going to do with an electric vehicle out in the middle of the forest? What if we run out of batteries? You're screwed. His whole impetus for designing this was the, the rationale that Teslas make great day. Tesla semi makes a great day truck if you're driving around the city. But long-haul truckers can't use that thing. What the hell are you going to do with that? A diesel-electric hybrid makes much more sense for industrial trucking. And he's 100% right. Guys, it's cool, man. This is... He's a cool dude. Yeah, he's a lumberjack. This guy, oh yeah, he's a big lumberjack. And he talks like this the entire time. Very, very... Yeah, you could very much tell he's from the western parts of Canada, bud. Smart, dude genius and I, I love the spartan design it just it's just a truck it's just a truck this shows that we can make because dude it seems like the more technologically advanced a car is the less the lesser and lesser it gets to be a freaking car right like we can't make something simple anymore right we can't make something like a you know a, a detroit a detroit uh what is it, an 8V60? We can't make something like that. Stuff like that doesn't exist. It either has to be super space age or nothing, right? This truck bucks that trend. That's why I like it. Your father-in-law is a trucker. They get paid by the mile in time. Can't afford to charge for an hour. Yeah, that's, yeah, blood. That works. That works if you're like doing regional distribution around a city. So like the Tesla Semi, and it's I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm not going to trash the Tesla Semi. I think the Tesla Semi is really smart. 48 volt architecture. The Cybertruck motors are derived from the Tesla Semi. Uh, first of all, just in case anybody cared. It, so it's using the same 48 volt architecture. The Tesla trucks make great sense for a day cap. So a truck that's, say a train comes in, offloads a bunch of cargo at a, an intermodal terminal right and you're just moving that cargo maybe 40 50 miles at best tesla trucks unmatched there's you're not going to match the efficiency because you take one trip there you take one trip back guy goes home for the day leaves the truck on the charger overnight comes back does the same thing you 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 can't beat that in efficiency i'm sorry you just can't makes sense for the city but if you're out in the middle of british columbia doing logging Ain't no charging station around there, and you're going to be hauling more than 50 miles. I don't know the answer to that, Jens. So yeah, a little, little bit of a truck tangent, but that's awesome. I think that's cool. It's just a truck. It's completely purpose-built. There's no frills about this thing. That's why I like it. I think more people should do stuff like this. If somebody built a truck that worked like this nowadays... I'm not talking a half-ton quad cab four-door truck that's basically an SUV with a pickup bed attached to the back. I'm talking single cab, long box truck. You build a truck like that, people will buy it. Absolutely. But we can't do that because we have to sell an $80,000 luxury truck or something stupid. <clears throat> that's why Pepsi got them. Loads from distribution centers to stores on the daily. It makes perfect sense, dude. Yeah. Regional distribution, Tesla truck is unmatched. For district distribution and long haul trucking, the Edison will eat its lunch. Eat its lunch. Even with Tesla in there, Tesla's working on a 200 amp charger, if I'm remembering right, or maybe it was 500 amps, I forget. They're working on basically fast charging for the semi, which, dude, please do it. Like, I, I, I'm not saying it's one or the other. I want both of these things. It'd be pretty sweet. Don't act like you don't want a TRX. I like my trucks, dude. Like my trucks. Have you seen the photos of the super utilitarian cheap Toyota trucks? Yes, I want one. Do you know how cool a truck needs to be? And how Spartan a truck needs to be for me to want an import? 
With that being said, that Toyota truck, the Chirp, I want it. I want one. I want three. Dude, a $10,000 truck. Sticker price, brand new, $10,000. I'd, I'd buy five of them. You could buy five of them for the price of one half-ton quad cab six-foot box truck nowadays. You know, actually, you could buy eight. Like, what? Well, you'd be crazy not to want that. And that's why they don't sell it here, because it would put all, make all those other trucks useless. It is known that heavy elements are from supernovas, so, su so supernova is when there's no hydrogen left. So how does the sun still exist? Sun's got a lot of hydrogen left, Gabriel. A lot of hydrogen. It's got a lot of hydrogen left. We figured that out from the color, believe it or not. You can tell when it starts running out of fuel because it changes color. It gets like blue and white. Actually, our sun, our sun emits white light. It just looks yellow to us because at, because atmospheric diffusion from the gases in our atmosphere. True story. That's why the sun at sunrise is like super orangey, but during the middle of the day, it's like yellow. IFT3, who wants it? Who wants it? All right, let's go. Yeah, Aqualux, genius, practical engineering. I love it, man. I love it. And I, dude, you know how much, you know how much I have to, like, it's the same thing with the import. You know how much I, you know how much you have to convince me to like a hybrid truck? I don't like hybrid systems. I really don't. I think it's way too, too much complication. But in this particular scenario, good idea. Please scroll back. Logging trucks are not long haul. No, listen to what I said. I said logging in industrial trucking and long haul and operative word. I understand that farm. You don't need to tell me. Yeah, even I'll look at it. Let's read about this. Okay. Yeah, I, I got you. I know logging go is very it's a pain in the butt on the truck. It's, it's really difficult to charge. I mean, you're still still dealing with the same problem. There's no charging station out there. You're in a forest, right? <laughs> that was the gist of what I'm trying to say. Uh, the diesel-electric hybrid makes perfect sense, and you can scavenge from going up and down the hill. Also, it needs to be an off-road vehicle. <laughs> they say, how do I charge this truck? There's nothing out here but trees. Edison's response, use the trees. He's blunt, but he's got a point. All right, anyway, let's check this out. This is SpaceX's IFT3 report on the path to rapid reusability. <clears throat> Starship is designed to fundamentally alter humanity's access to space, ultimately enabling us to make life multiplanetary. The third flight of Starship and Super Heavy. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the text a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. The third flight... The third flight test of Starship and Super Heavy made tremendous strides towards this future and was an important step on the road to rapidly reliable reusable rockets. Uh, 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 for the four R words. On March 14, 2024, Starship successfully lifted off at 8.25 a.m. Central Time from Starbase, Texas. All 33 Raptor engines on the Super Heavy booster started up and started up successfully and completed a full duration burn during ascent, followed by a successful hot stage separation. This was the second successful ascent of the Super Heavy booster, the world's most powerful launch vehicle. At stage separation, Starship's six engine, six second, Starship's six second stage Raptor engines all successfully and all started successfully and powered the vehicle to its expected trajectory, becoming the first starship to complete its full duration ascent burn. Word. Following the stage separation, Super Heavy initiated its boost back burn, which sends commands to 13 of the vehicle's 33 Raptor engines to propel the rocket towards its intended landing location. All 13 engines ran successfully until six engines began shutting down, triggering a benign early boost back shutdown. Uh...
The booster then continued to descend until attempting its landing burn, which commands the same 13 engines used during boost back to perform the final pl the planned final slowing for the rocket before soft touchdown in the water. Six engines, the six the six engines that shut down early in the boost back burn were disabled from attempting the landing burn startup, leaving seven engine See, leaving seven engines commanded to start up with two successfully reaching main stage ignition. Ugh. The booster had lower than expected landing burn thrust when contact was lost at approximately 462 meters in altitude over the Gulf of Mexico and just under seven minutes into the mission. The most likely root cause of the early boost back burn shutdown was determined to be continued filter blockage where liquid oxygen is supplied to the engines leading to a loss of inlet pressure in the engine oxygen turbo pumps. SpaceX implemented hardware changes ahead of Flight 3 to mitigate this issue, which resulted in the booster progressing to its first ever landing burn attempt. Attempt? <laughs> Super heavy boosters for Flight 4 and beyond will get additional hardware inside oxygen tanks to further improve propellant, propellant filtration capabilities. And utilizing data gathered from Super Heavy's first ever landing bird attempt, additional hardware and software changes are being implemented to increase startup reliability of Raptor engines in landing conditions. During Starship's coast phase, the vehicle accomplished several of the flight test additional objectives, including the first ever test of its payload bay door in space. The vehicle also successfully completed a propellant transfer demonstration moving liquid oxygen from the header tank into the main tank. This test provided valuable data for eventual ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfers that will enable missions like returning astronauts to the moon under the Artemis program. That, yeah, the, the NASA's lunar program. Sorry. Uh, several minutes after Starship began its coast phase, the vehicle began losing the ability con to control its attitude. Starship continued flying its normal trajectory, but given the loss of attitude control, the vehicle automatically triggered a pre pre the vehicle automatically triggered a pre-planned command to skip its planned on-orbit reflight of a single Raptor engine. Starship went on to experience its first ever re-entry from space, providing valuable data on heating and vehicle control during hypersonic re-entry. Vehicle control. You sure about that or? Kidding. The lack of attitude control resulta resulted in an off-nominal entry, with ships seeing much larger than anticipated heating on both protected and unprotected areas. High-definition live views of the entry and a considerable amount of tele telemetry were successfully transmitted in real-time by Starlink terminals operating on Starship. The flight test's conclusion came when telemetry was lost at approximately 65 kilometers in altitude, roughly 49 minutes into the mission. The most likely root cause of the unplanned roll was determined to be clogging of the valves responsible for roll control. SpaceX has since added additional roll control thrusters on upcoming starships to improve attitude control redundancy and upgraded hardware for improved resilience to blockage. Interesting. Following the flight test, SpaceX led the investigation efforts with oversight from the FAA and participation from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. They, they, they worked with NASA and the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. During flight three, neither vehicle's automated flight system, flight safety system was triggered and no vehicle debris impacted outside of predefined, predefined hazard areas. Pending the FAA findings of no public safety impact, a license modification for the next flight can be issued without formal closure of the mishap investigation. Bingo. Good stuff. Upgrades derived from the flight test will debut on the next Starship launch from Starbase on Flight 4 as we turn our focus from achieving... From achieving orbit to demonstrating the ability to return and reuse Starship and Super Heavy. The team incorporated numerous hardware and software improvements in addition to operational changes, including the jettison of Super Heavy's hot stage adapter following boost back to reduce booster mass of the final fizz. What the hell are you doing? Whoa. 
Upgrades derived, let me read that again. Upgrades derived from the flight test will debut on the next launch from Starbase on Flight 4. As we turn our focus from achieving orbit to, orbit to demonstrating the ability to return and reuse Starship and Super Heavy, the team incorporated numerous hardware and software improvements in addition to operational changes, including the jettison of Starship of Super Heavy's hot stage adapter following boost back to reduce booster mass for the final phase of flight. <laughs> That's awesome. So... I guess, Dax, if you're still out there, yeah, it sounds like your source was right. <laughs> uh, uh, but also, could be software. But that sounds that sounds correct. That's awesome. <laughs> They're going to do a Saturn V and jettison the, jettison the hot staging ring. That's cool, man. Why? Uh, they're probably doing this right now because they don't have a better solution. They'll figure out one. They're probably working... It, Thomas, anybody... Any of my Starbase tank watchers here that watch this stream as well? There's two different types of hot staging rings, isn't there? They're working on a redesign. Aren't they? What are the propellant filters filtering out? Uh, I'll get to that in a second, Rem. That's a good question. Honestly, I have no clue since everything is indoors now. I guarantee you we'll see a different a redesigned hot staging ring in the future. Cannot confirm nor deny. Yeah, okay. Cool. Good to know. All right. So, clogging. Rem, we can get to your question now. That was a little bit quicker than I thought. Clogging. What's clogging? Why is it clogging? Um, These filters are getting clogged with solid oxygen. Yeah, it's not like there's just crap floating around in the tanks and it clogs the filter. They're getting clogged with solid oxygen. Absolutely. It had that has very much to do with the complicated plumbing of Starship. More complicated plumbing is going to create more more complicated scenarios. There is uh more complicated scenarios for moving that propellant around and moving liquid oxygen around quickly does sometimes create solidification if you cool something too fast. Filt or it could have something to do with flow. The filters could also be uh, flow regulators or turbul turbulent flow regulators. Basically, the liquid oxygen can swirl around and it could cool something too fast. Frost could build up on the filter and that's the end of that. Could be metal shavings, Aaron Orr, but unlikely. It's unlikely that you're going to get metal shavings in some engines, but not others, especially because they're all using the same pickup. This implies that it's something downstream that's not fr that's not originating in the tank. Because if it was originating at the tank pickup, like indu like inducing metal shavings, right, through the pickup, first of all, there's a filter inside of the pickup right there. Second of all, this seems to imply that these are the filters that are going to the engines, because not all the engines ignited. But not all of them... Not all of them failed either, right? This gets into moving cryogenic commodities around a system that's extremely complicated. Raptor, uh, there's 33 Raptors at the bottom of Super Heavy. You know, well, how many of them shut down? You have 30 of them shutting down at m most engine cutoff, right? 13 of them relighting to make 16. No. No, no, it's 10. So you have three of them constantly on and 10 of them reigniting, right? Seven of those 10 that reignite out for the boost back burn after hot staging did not reignite. That sounds like, that sounds like thermal conditioning to me. Uh, basically, when they shut the engines off, they may have, they may have, sh they may have had a geysering effect inside of the plumbing. It's possible. They could have been a, there could have been a hydraulic hammering effect there, and the hydraulic hammering effect could have clogged a filter with frost. It's totally possible. You guys ever, if you live in an older structure, you ever shut like the shower off or shut the sink off, and you shut it off and you hear eh! noise. It's not like a straining noise. That's hydraulic hammering. Hydraulic hammering with cryogenic propellants will create it'll create condensation. That 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 it'll it'll create frost. You're changing the temperatures on things very very quickly by shutting a cryogenic line off. It only it's only going to take a couple seconds for the line to try and the 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 line to to be okay uh, to be too much of a temperature differential, right? 
to to have frost accumulate basically that's the right way to say that uh you're you're gonna you're gonna change the temperature of the pipe where you shut the fuel off and for that momentary second the pipe could could have frost build up on the inside depending on what goes in there or what doesn't go in there remember where Starship is doing this reignition is cold. It's very cold up there. There's not a lot of anything up there. The temperature is really low. There's a big absence of heat because there's a big absence of matter to absorb said heat. Right? So you this could very easily cause propellants to solidify inside of the pipes. Very easy. Yeah. I mean, that... SpaceX is very, very familiar with solid oxygen permeation on things and solid oxygen accumulation because they're using densified propellants. What is the temperature up there? Rig... Where Starship is staging, dude, that's like, I don't know, 100,000... I was about to say 100,000 meters. I, I, don't, I forget what the staging velocity is, dude. Uh, anywhere... Yeah, anywhere above like 100,000 meters, dude... I, I I guess like we would probably say it's like minus 200 C or something. It's something ridiculous, but that's not really a good way to look at it, dude. Because it's not that there's remember temperature is the is the measuring of heat in matter. Okay, all right, you're measuring heat. That's what it does. That's what temperature is. Okay, that's like centigrade in Fahrenheit. That's Celsius. Like that's that's what that's what those are. They're you know temperature low temperature is not cold. It's the absence of heat. Okay, that's important to understand. Now, with that being said, up there, right, there's nothing. And this is why scientists use Kelvin. <laughs> because absolute zero in the Kelvin scale means there's nothing. There's nothing there to absorb the heat. Nothing. There's your vacuum. It's the absence of matter and the absence of heat, of matter, to absorb said heat, Right? 70 kilometer separation, 105 at boost back. It's freaking cold. Right? So I don't don't think about it as really being really really, really cold. Space is not really, really cold. I don't care what anybody says. You know, you see in the movies, oh space is so cold. You come from a warm planet, Anakin. Space is cold. Space is not cold. Space is nothing. Because we're not just measuring heat in space. We're, you measure matter. There's nothing in space. There is some matter. There's light. You know that. <laughs> Those stars. Stars like our sun kind of emit light. We know that. So there's something up there. But there's nothing that really absorbs heat very well. All right, Dax. See you, buddy. And the here's the here's the weird thing. Here's the re weird thing, dude. Up there, there's no matter. So there's no heat. So it's really, really cold, right? But it's not really, really cold. There's no matter. But if you have a satellite up there, the satellite absorbs the heat very, very well because satellites are made out of metal. Metal is very thermally conductive. Thermal stuff. And what's inside of the satellite? He computers inside of the satellite. Guess what? Computers are moving around electricity. You move around electricity, you make heat. So you're getting heated by the sun and you get heating, you're getting heated by your own systems. Cooling... Thermal radiation systems on satellites, space stations, spacecraft are super freaking important. Probably more important than, like, maybe second to, like, the life support systems, I guess. Like, for human-rated spacecraft, the thermal regulation and thermal radiation on uh, thermal radiative effects. So, like, thermal, not the, not the heat shield. I'm talking about, like, radiators. The radiators on a spacecraft, you lose those, you're screwed. You are screwed. You might as well not have oxygen. Yeah, that's a you don't want to lose those. That's very that's very it's a very important design consideration with spacecraft. Yeah, JDG, that love how you love how they point out the high definition live view with Starlink. Hey, it does. It has it. It gave us that view over there, man. Thermal management. That was the right word. Sorry, I was dancing around it, no, Mr. Bond. Thank you. So my question is, why not divert some of the heat generated somewhere else to stop frost from forming in the fuel lines? Heat is actually going to make condensation, Rick. You want the lines, you don't want the lines to change temperature. Problem is, a line where you shut the valve and the line's now empty is going to absorb some heat. Why? Because there's not super chilled liquid oxygen in there. That will create condensation. 
it's not the engines work fine when all the plumbing is flowing right it's when you stop it and you turn it back on frost will accumulate because you're heating it up when you heat up the oxygen it's going to when you heat it up it's you're going to get condensation on components because you're changing temperature it happens SpaceX showed the hot staging ring redesign. Yeah. Yeah. See, they are. They're working on a redesign. So for now, just jettison the Mark I design. In the future, they'll have that. A lower mass solution. And it's weird because it looks exactly like Soyuz. It's very strange, man. So they need a better insulative solution. It's possible. So SpaceX's solution seems to be to install more filters. So... Okay, I say that this is going to create condensation, and that might confuse a couple of people. How is heating up the propellants going to get it to solidify? Wouldn't it evaporate? Yes, absolutely. Yes, it would. But now you have a pipe that's a different temperature than the pipe that, that's behind said valve. So, right, you have your pipe going to the engine. You have your valve, that your flow, your flow valve, right, that prevents the oxygen from going in and out. When the engine shuts off, the valve closes. And now behind that, you have super chilled liquid oxygen. This pipe heats up. This pipe, this pipe is now heated. SpaceX with Super Heavy has to do this in rapid succession. They have to shut the engine off. Five seconds later, you have to turn it back on. That is a extreme. This isn't Kerbal. That's a really hard thing to do. That puts a lot of strain on the entire system. So what do I mean when I say that it's going to solidify? Well, normally rocket engines are thermally conditioned. You basically have you have your main flow valves and then you have secondary valves that allow a little bit of propellant to go in and they they basically prime all the lines going to the engine now obviously you don't want to dry fire a rocket engine right that's really bad for it that'll make an explosion not how you want and secondly you want all the pipes going to that engine to be cold because if you have a valve that's holding back propellants, you have your engine over here, right? And you have a pipe going to your engine, your engine and your, your turbine impeller inlet. You open that valve real quick. Some of that liquid oxygen, right? Some of that liquid oxygen could evaporate. It could, uh, it could create, uh, now, like, dude, you could create all kind of thermal transients in there that could cause solidification. It could be the propellant flow. It could be cavitation in the propellants from starting and stopping them real quick. There's a thousand different things that this could be. SpaceX is clearly dealing with some type of solidification that's happening there, right? They're clearly dealing with that. Uh, so their solution is to install more filters at the at the inlets, right? Right. Dude, you're gonna get you're gonna get solidification inside of there. Even though it's really, really hot, going from really, really hot to really, really cold, really, really fast can get you can solidify propellants. It's possible. Especially when you don't have to, when you don't have convection and conduct you have convection and just condu conductivity in that pipe. It's possible. And you definitely don't want solid oxygen chunks going into your turbine impeller. That would be a very bad idea. Remember the problem pipes and stationeers? Yep. Yeah, it could happen. Starship is the spiritual successor to N1. Changed my mind. It's like the N1 and the space shuttle had a kid. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of mass flow which has to be stopped without cavitation or hammering and then restarted in a really short time frame. Yeah. The niddle. N1 and shuttle. The, the niddle. Oh my gosh. So, yeah, long story short, changing the thermal properties of that pipe really, really fast can cause solid oxygen. It's possible. You, you could flash freeze the pipe, and that would cause propellants to solidify inside of it. Interesting. What would you try to change? Question right. Are they adding filters to smooth liquid flow? 
I'm not sure if it's keeping solid oxygen out, Aranor, or improving flow. I'll bet you it's a combination of both. You, you and Rig, this is going to kind of deal with your question a little bit. You, you do not want solid oxygen in those lines. They're called liquid fuel rocket engines for a reason. You have anything but liquid going into those, you're going to have a bad day. Gas goes into the gas goes into the inlet, bad day. Sol solids go into the inlet, you're going to have a really bad day. Right? So, what is blocking the thrusters? Are they freezing? Well, Geek, you know when we watch SpaceX launch, right? And you see, like, Falcon 9, you see the, the Merlin 1D vacuum vent pipes, how uh, liquid oxygen is immediately solidifying and accumulating on the end of that vent pipe? That. That, but with your RCS, because Starship doesn't have a dedicated reaction control system. They're using residual tank ullage pressure because the end, when the engines fire, it repressurizes the system, right? They're using the just vent valves as their RCS to simplify the design. Now, because of this, you have the exact same phenomenon. You have solid oxygen accumulation on the end of the line. And it was enough to block it. It was enough to block the line. <laughs> and that's why, that's why it did that. It kind of spun out of control, right? Now, Rig, you just said, what would I do? Well, okay, let's think about this for a second. This is not me trying to teach. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk it through. Let's see if we can learn something. SpaceX seems very committed to putting filters into this. Now, okay, so what's the downside of doing that? P putting more filters in adds complexity into the design, no doubt. You're adding complexity, that's more components. That tells me that SpaceX... That is not a seemingly easy thing to fix, right? So that tells me that SpaceX is doing this for a very good reason. The reason why they're doing it is because that's the simplest solution to solving whatever, whatever solid oxygen is happening inside of those things, right? Right? So... I'm thinking. Uh, let, me, let me think it through. The, if SpaceX think, thinks that's that... Think, thinks that that is the simplest solution, that tells me that a hardware change is absolutely necessary. SpaceX wouldn't change it unless they absolutely had to. So whatever the solid oxygen problem is, is something that's very insurmountable. You're going to have to deal with solid oxygen being in the lines due to, the, due to just how super heavy flies, like what, what, they're, what they're asking it to do. If there was a simpler solution, they probably would have figured out and done it. With that being said, what I what, what I would suggest in my armchair rocket scientist mind here, and there's rig, here's the thing. There's no way they didn't think of this. There's no way. What I would suggest is don't shut the engines off. Raptor engines are capable of deep throttling due to high chamber pressure. Deep throttle, deep throttle 13 raptors. Don't shut them off. You don't shut them off, you don't have this problem. But here's the thing. Spa There's no way SpaceX didn't think of this. All rockets have a limit on throttling. It's not like Kerbal where you can set a rocket engine to 1% power. Even rockets that have the ability to deep throttle, if you get down below 40% throttle, 30% throttle, it'll flame out. It'll flame out. You're just not delivering enough propellants to maintain an explosion to make thrust. Basically, you get a flamethrower, not a rocket engine. Spoiler alert, when your rocket engines are acting as flamethrowers, something blows up that you don't want to explode. Deep throttling rocket engines is a notoriously difficult problem to solve. So, this tells me that SpaceX hasn't, they've thought about it, and whatever the absolute bare minimum for 13 rocket engines is, is still exceeding the thrust of six Raptor engines on Starship. Basically, if they didn't shut the outer 10 off and just kept if they, if they kept all 13 engines ignited, they would go to stage and Starship wouldn't go anywhere. Starship would fire all six engines and Super Heavy would just keep pushing it because the thrust to weight ratio on Super Heavy at that point exceeds Starship. Because you got to remember, Super Heavy is bigger. It's way bigger than, than Starship is. But it has like 90% of its fuel expended and 13 Raptors behind it. 
Starship has a full tank of gas, potentially 100 tons of payload, and only six engines. There's no way the TWR-13 Raptor engines, even deep throttled, is going to be below six engines at full throttle with a full tank of gas. Not a chance. See what I mean? This is... That's an insurmountable problem. They ought, If they could have kept 13 engines firing, they already would have done that. They have to shut those engines down to get Starship to get a clean separation for hot staging. So now this proposes a problem of immediately stopping and immediately restarting your engines. They need that thrust for Super Heavy to be able to get it back to the launch site. Higher TWR in first stages is always more efficient. Even though your first stage has more Delta V, the name of the game for efficiency with first stages is how quickly it can get the second stage up there, and that favors high thrust to weight. High thrust to weight gets you a more efficient performance with first stages, higher energy first stages, long story short. That's why Super Heavy has like 70 mega newtons worth of power, like way more than any other rocket needs, because TWR is the name of the game for efficiency for your stage. What about a nine engine ship? It sounds similar to a problem. Yeah, a nine engine ship, Aerodite, maybe, but now you're going and changing the plumbing again. Who knows? You might have that problem again. You know what I mean? Or figure out a solution that makes it so you don't have to light all 10 of the, the ring there. Maybe light five of them. Maybe six. Shut down, I don't know, shut down 25 or 26 engines, right? And leave the, the other nine to just do their thing. Six on the inner ring, three on the center, so you don't have this problem during boost back. That would be my solution. That's a good idea. Wait, is that why Super Heavy did a run in the sea because of frozen RCS? No, that's why Starship did a run during re-entry, Violin. Super Heavy had solid oxygen clog the oxidizer lines to seven out of the 13 Raptor engines that were required for boost back. And they were unable to be restarted because that solid oxygen basically uh, sealed the plumbing. And the computer rightfully realized that you don't want to put propellant, you don't want to try to pump propellants through a through a clogged line. Uh, anybody that's ever had their pipe bursts in winter knows exactly why you don't want to do that. Tessa turbo fans. Huh? What are you saying? It's turbo fan engine fuel systems. When a plane is coming down pretty quickly from cruise direct to landing, it was found that small amounts of water in the fuel was freezing into a slush where normally it would melt on the warm water. It's nice to pass through. Just sticky enough to cling to the sides of the filler tubes and cause fuel starvation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thermal transients. Such a pain in the butt, dude. You guys want to know why valves are valves are such a pain in the pain in the butt with in the in the aerospace industry, planes, rockets, whatever? It's because of temperature differences. Because a valve doesn't... <laughs> material science doesn't do very well. Metal doesn't do very well when it's like minus 200 C on this side and 70 C on this side, right? Like, that's that's a huge difference in temperature. That's why valves, that's why valves are so tricky to get right. Yeah, uh, aerodite. Uh, yeah, not let. Yeah, see, if you shut down. Yeah, but see, okay. Now that I'm thinking about it, you. You still you still have to restart those engines. If you only shut down, you don't shut down, ten engines, or you don't shut down, thirty engines at at engine cutoff, right? You shut down twenty six of them, right? You still have to relight those engines to get the boost back performance that you need. Because once again, the name of the game is thrust thrust to weight for first stages. You want to make a more efficient first stage? Give it more thrust. More boosters, baby. Any Kerbal player knows that. Am I right? More boosters. That's more efficiency, more efficiency for your first stage. The faster it gets, if the faster it gets your second stage up there, the more efficient it is. I wonder if the engines are pulling enough negative. I wonder if the engines are pulling enough negative pressure at the inlets to get some solidification. That's my guess, dude. It could be turbulent flow. These fuel filters could be to. It could be preventing cavitation, thermal differences in the pipe. I'm telling you, this is a thermal problem because frost wouldn't accumulate if there wasn't a thermal problem, right?
they got to find a way to thermally condition these engines fast. Uh, we're talking, like you said, like blue, it's a five second window, you know, because those engines shut off, the booster flips around and then they immediately refire. That's very difficult. That's a very difficult problem to solve. Just put a turbocharger in it. And the rocket engines already have turbos. They have a gas generator. That's a gigantic turbo. It's just, a, it's a jet engine attached to a fuel pump. They already have turb. They already have turbines in them. How about putting, putting dividers in the tanks on the booster? They already did that. There's a header tank in Super Heavy Journey for that exact reason. That's already been done. I don't know. I'm a high schooler. Yeah. Yeah, we can tell. It's all good, man. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just busting your chops a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> Main tank, you're talking about Starship. No, I'm not. Super Heavy Super heavy and Starship both have header tanks, dude. For that exact reason, dude. Yo, oh, yeah. Propellant management. Yeah, Super Heavy Super heavy has header tanks, dude. That's how... It, it basically has a plenum. Plenums are usually used in pneumatics, though. There's a plenum. There, there's a, a small catch tank, like a day tank on a boat almost. Inside of the main fuel tank. Yep, yep. The, you know what the interesting thing is, fellas? The N1, the failed Soviet moon rocket, had the exact same problems. Yeah, interestingly enough, filters kept getting clogged because of the complicated plumbing on the N1. That's why it didn't work. Same as Falcon 9, it also has a header tank. Yep, yep. I know they need to make in the internal surface like that metal plate from the 90s that was billed as, as the freezer food defroster. <laughs> and when had it happen at launch, yep. Yep. It's interesting because their solution, Hellfish, their solution as well was to put more filters in the design, which, which has me think that it's not about FOD contamination. Putting filters in the design is filtering out solid oxygen. Yeah, it's filtering out something that can't be filtered out on the ground. Makes sense. Updated timeline. Yeah, this is a really, long story short, it's a really difficult problem to solve because no one's ever tried to move a 22-story building around in space like that. Super Heavy's equivalent of a building with 22 floors on it, by the way. That's a big object moving around in space. And then you have to make the rocket engines, arguably the most complicated rocket engine ever devised by man, work on the bottom. <laughs> in rapid succession. So this is coming from Craig Mauser. Side-by-side -side comparisons of IFT3 and IFT4 timelines. Can they use the heat from entry to heat the valves? Well, where it's doing the boost back burn lung, there's no heat. There's nothing. That's the problem. The vacuum is probably causing solidification, if I had to guess. Because you're because of insane temperature differences from a line being cryogenically primed and not from engine cutoff. Starting and start stopping and starting a rocket. Long story short, starting and starting starting and stopping a rocket engine is a difficult problem to solve down here. It's an extremely difficult problem to solve up there. Yeah, so, no doubt that SpaceX will find a solution though. They'll figure it out. The filters might be the solution. We'll see. How hard is solid oxygen? I don't know, Hellfish. I would guess the consistency somewhere near ice. The crazy part is that they have it working fine for getting the skyscraper to space. They just they're just running into complications getting the skyscraper to turn around.
feel like if you add more filters, it just creates more turbulence and you can make the problem worse. Am I wrong? These filters are probably, see, the, there might be flow filters, JDG. That's the thing. It could be for flow. The filters might not even be for filtering out solid oxygen. I'm sure they have those in there. But it could be a filter that's designed to create a certain type of flow to flow into the to flow into the turbine and inlet correctly. That's possible. I'm sure there's another name for it. SpaceX might be referring to it as a filter just because, once again, like with Starliner, the stuff's hard to understand. But who knows? All right, let's see. What are the timeline differences? They're shortening up the fuel flow here. Yeah, like a bend in the pipe is going to create turbulence. So if you have a flow filter, like if the pipe elbows and then goes into the rocket engine, you'd want a flow filter after that because you don't want like a swirling propellant going into a swirling impeller. That would be bad. That would be, It needs to be nice and uniform going in. Faster filling, for sure. And yeah, just, yeah, see, they switched it. They switched to methane first, then liquid oxygen. And before they were doing ox, then meth. Yes. Booster locks load underway. Yeah, and they're doing ship first, dude. Interesting. Interesting, 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 interesting. And it is laminar flow. Laminar flow applies to all all fluids, dude. Yeah, just clean, uniform flow. Liquids and liquids and gases, dude. Raptor begins engine till nineteen forty. Booster prop load complete. Ship prop load complete. It's interesting. The booster, despite being start, despite fuel starting. Dude, that is an insane amount of propellant to move in that amount of time. That's crazy. The ship starts... Ship starts fuel... It starts commodity filled 10 minutes before the booster. And they both get done within a minute of each other. That's crazy, man. Are we going to do Fallout today? Yeah, probably. It's not going to be long, though. Maybe an hour at best. Dude, sequencing 33 engines in three seconds is insane. That, I, it's impressive, dude. Flight timeline, what do we got here? Lift off, Max Q, Mr. Miko, Super Heavy Miko, they changed the name. Hot staging, boost back burn, shut down, hot staging jettison. Oh, that, huh. How does the booster structurally support ship first fueling? Because it's made out of steel and it's really freaking strong. Four mil thick stainless, four mil, it's four millimeter thick 304x stainless that's really strong stuff yeah crafty that's how i was worried about that but then i realized that you know it's not a balloon tank four mil thick steel is ridiculous for the for for uh aerospace four mil thick anything is really thick that like especially if you're choosing stainless as your uh your material use um uh, yeah, long story short, it's made out of steel, not not aluminum. If it was aluminum, oh yeah, yeah, it would you know. Yeah, there's just slight adjustments for the timelines here, but yeah, interesting. An exciting landing. That's what that says. Do you know how much computing power Falcon 9 has? I mean, like, the Saturn had 36 kilobytes. Uh, uh, it has more than that, Violent. Falcon 9 actually uses Unix. It's, it's a Unix system. Yeah, believe it or not. Yeah, well, Linux. 
Linux based, sorry, not Unix, but you, you get what I'm trying to say, right? I know the difference. I know that they're the same, but they're not. I get it, right? Software people don't kill me. I, I swear, I, I swear, I'm, we're good. We're cool. Falcon 9 uses a Linux, uh, a Linux based system, uh, and they have three processors in RAID, basically. Yeah, they have three off the shelf processors. It's something that they could, that's it. We don't know exactly what it is. I think they're Intel processors, but I could be wrong. Slowly resheathes the knife. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Sorry. I, I, I realized what I said like two seconds after. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, please don't kill me. I swear. <laughs> like, don't do that again. <laughs> Might have missed ship 29 doing a landing flip and burn in that photo unless you covered it earlier. Flame Trench is starting in about two hours, Journey. Yeah. Why Linux? Uh, do you want your rocket to be running on a Windows operating system? Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Your rocket's launching into space. Hey, we got to restart your computer for you. It's time for an update. Oh! <laughs> you know... <laughs> Do you want your rocket running Windows? I don't. <laughs> Windows update mid-flight? It would happen. It would happen. You know it would happen. Clippy, it looks like you're trying to launch a rocket. Do you need help? No, Clippy! Oh, oh it blew up! You suck! Stupid clip! <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Just put it out there. Yeah, your settings have changed back. Yeah, yeah. We changed your settings back to how they were before when the rocket exploded. Oh, it exploded. Hey, I see your rocket exploded. Do you need help? Jason, you're learning EFI development. It is OS-less. I would ship that. Would I ship that to space? Not without something else. EFI development. Cool. I see that edge is in your main your main telemetry viewer. Why are you using something else? Wait, flip and burn from ship twenty nine. Hold on. Oh, yo. Thank you for pointing that out. No way, dude. No belly flop for this one. At least with Windows, you would be... <laughs> At least with Windows, you would be guaranteed to have telemetry enabled at all times. Ship 29 won't make it there, so no need to get excited. Spicy. Thomas, I'll say it once, I'll say it again. Unless unless this suborbital trajectory is coming down somewhere further downrange than like Australia, I highly doubt this thing is gonna survive. That is my armchair rocket scientist opinion. I really hope to be proven wrong by SpaceX. I would like nothing better. Most stuff that flies on this re-entry trajectory does not survive. Most things. If they can somehow get Starship to do it, I'd be very impressed. But most things that fly this re-entry trajectory, most things that have flown this re-entry trajectory in the past have not been made out of steel. So there's a variable here. Clearly SpaceX thinks it'll make it through. The trajectory that Starship is going to fly on is very similar to Starliner with Centaur, with the dual engine Centaur disposal trajectory, or a more well known thing would be the Space Shuttle's orange tank. The orange tank was disposed of before the shuttle got on orbit and purposely re entered over the Indian Ocean to ensure that it would burn up. It's a very steep re entry trajectory. So, like, let me put it to you like this. If you had a capsule fly on that re-entry trajectory, it would not survive, even with a heat shield. You put the shuttle on that? Nope. 
Uh-uh, nothing would come back. Maybe, maybe a couple of tiles. It's a very steep trajectory. The margins here are very, very small for re-entering. But then again, what we know about re-entering is all based off of ship, ships that are primarily made out of aluminum, which is completely different than stainless steel. So let me, let me put it to you like this, Thomas. If it makes it through re-entry, I'll be very impressed. There's not many things that could fly that trajectory and make it to the, make it to the ocean in one piece. What about an Apollo capsule? Nope. It would pop like a zit. Not. Wait, what? Why? That doesn't make much sense. The Apollo re-entry was much more aggressive. Do you guys... You guys go right to gotcha. Do you guys even know about the Apollo re-entry trajectory? You know, they bounced off the atmosphere to mitigate to mitigate thermals, right? They skipped off the atmosphere to, to make sure that they didn't flux too much heat into the heat shield fast. Yeah, if too much heat into the heat shield too quickly, we'll burn the heat shield completely off. And then you have no heat shield. That's bad. One second. Like a rock on a lake. Yeah, it, yeah, the, you've you're flexing way too much heat into the heat shield way too fast. It's not that the heat shield couldn't take that amount of energy. It's that it can't take amount, that amount of energy fast. Your rate of heat transfer is the problem here. That S, now, here's the thing, man. Maybe the Apollo capsule could do it. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't want to be on it if we were going to test something like that. But Starship is designed to return from Transmartian injection. Or trans Earth injection from Mars, right? I think that SpaceX is insisting on this steep reentry trajectory to basically trial by fire their thermal protection systems so they can learn more about that for maybe in the future when a starship comes back from refilling HLS out at the moon. I can dream. I can dream. Okay. Flight 4 predictions. Well, that's what we're talking about. I tried re-entering from the moon in a 100% steep trajectory. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a smart man. Do we know what altitude it broke up? They said it. It was 65, 65 kilometers off the deck. Honestly, dude, Starship, this thing, IFT-3, re-entering backwards, made it through peak heating, which is pretty freaking impressive, dude. <laughs> that's, pre that's pretty good. It flew Raptor first into into plasma, and it made it past peak heating, which is pretty freaking cool. That's that's impressive. So you know that that maybe there's something to this stainless steel stuff. You know, that's pretty freaking cool. Refilling HLS at the moon. Thought HLS had to return to Earth. I don't know. Crafty, I'm basing this off of contingency. Maybe I said maybe. Maybe in the future they switch it to review refilling at the moon. Doesn't make sense to take HLS all the way back here. Send another Starship out. Especially since Starship was built with the thermal protection system in the first place. You don't want to refuel. HLS wouldn't have enough fuel to get all the way back to low Earth orbit. If it did, I'll be very impressed. You know, refill it 15 times, send it out to the moon, land it on the moon, have it be on the moon, come back off the moon, and then circularize back around to Earth. I highly doubt it has enough fuel to do that. I would love to be proven wrong, though. It makes much more sense after the first time you get that thing out there to refuel it out there. Because there's no need to pay, you don't need to, it doesn't make sense to pay for all the mass to come back to Earth orbit just to fill it up to get out of Earth orbit again and also go to the moon. Why don't you just refill it so you can do multiple moon landings at the moon? This is all theory on my part, though. It's all theory on my part. Once again, I just play Kerbal, all right? Just, I just play Kerbal. That's all I do. Okay. So I'll just play KSP. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. That's all I do. Is reentry heat re is reentry heat really necessary, or is it possible to return without violent? Yeah. <laughs> yes, 
what you just asked is saying is a boat getting wet is a boat getting wet uh, a requisite for it floating in water y yes yeah 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 there's not i mean there are ways to get around it dude if you found a way so say you were on orbit right and you had a fully fueled starship sitting on orbit could starship get back down without a thermal protection system yeah you would use all of the fuel inside of a fully fueled starship right yeah it could probably do it basically you would slow yourself down enough to where the point of atmospheric interface is not your velocity at, at, at ei is not very high you basically basically drop like a brick but in order to do that you would need rough napkin math you'd probably need four to five kilometers a second delta v to even do that remotely in any way shape or form because okay so let's think for a second you have starship with no thermal protection system what also is similar to starship that has no thermal protection system that also wants to come back super heavy super heavy doesn't have that doesn't have any tiles it doesn't need it stainless steel can absorb all the heat that's why it doesn't do supersonic retro propulsion so in my mind you'd have to get starship somewhere similar to a suborbital trajectory that is somewhere near super heavy. Now, what was super heavy staging velocity last time? How fast did it go? It went pretty dang fast. I don't know, how fast was Starship going during, during IFT3 at staging? Let's take a look. A minute away. All right, let's take a look. So there's staging right there, right? Speed, 5,600 kilometers an hour, okay? Altitude, 73 kilometers, okay, for the first stage right there. <clears throat> All right, so orbital velocity. Okay. SpaceX is using kilometers an hour, so we'll just use kilometers an hour. Orbital velocity is 27,100, give or take. Around 27,000 kilometers an hour. If you wanted to try and re-enter a vehicle with no thermal protection system, all right, you would need to decelerate 22,000 kilometers an hour. You would need enough delta V for that. So like I said, four or five kilometers a second easily with delta V. That doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't it make any sense? Well, are 30,000 composite tiles more mass than a full tank of fuel? No, this is significantly lighter than this. Use this to get back down, right? You could re-enter with no thermal protection, sure. You would need to find a way to, to get rid of that kinetic energy that you have. 27,000 miles an hour, sure. You could do this in KSP if you want, if you want to test it. Go do it in KSP. Same thing. I mean, re-entry in KSP is very, very forgiving, to be honest. The part, every part in KSP is made out of steel. <laughs> like every metal piece. There's no aluminum here. <laughs> but you could do this in KSP. Sure, no problem. Hey, now, if we were in Star Trek and could keep yourself moving forward to stay over the same point on the ground while descending slowly, it'd be no re-entry heating. Yeah, 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 JDG, that makes sense, but we got a little bit of a problem here. The, the problem is that this isn't Star Trek, <laughs> but your weak link is, this is Earth. I'm sure on some planet your martial arts style is very impressive, but your weak link is, this is Earth. <laughs> huh? <laughs> How about try my nuts to your foot style? How'd you like it? <laughs> Face to foot style. Oh, I'm bleeding, making me the victor. We have purposely trained him wrong, as a joke. <laughs> if you got a butt, I'll kick it. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for Wimblow. He is an idiot. <laughs> you'd need a gazillion barrels of fuel that way i mean ever yeah no doubt dude how cool would it be maybe in the future 
SpaceX bringing an HLS back to LEO and then refilling it enough times to just supersonic retro propulsion its way back down to the surface. <laughs> you know, that would be pretty cool, man. I'm not I'm not going to sit here and tell you boys that I wouldn't want to see that. You know, like, I'm sorry. That'd be pretty sick. You know, <laughs> yeah, tiger, tiger, lander, bird, birdie, birdie, birdie. Just make it out of Inko? <laughs> I kid. But on a more serious note, do you think there is there's an advanced metal that you could make the skin out of if you didn't care about costs and, and re-entry profile that would make a thermal protection system? Free unpowered descent possible. You could always build the TPS into the structure of the vehicle, Aquilux, but yeah... Uh, like an integral thermal protection system it's possible it could work you'd still you'd still have to deal with some ablation unless you're using tiles or something right tungsten too high mass rem but it should i mean tungsten melting point 6100 fahrenheit 3400 celsius The problem with tungsten is that it's extremely high density. So the only way, yeah, I mean, it's possible, sure. The, I, I think tungsten is too high mass, though. Um, its density is 19.25 grams per cubic centimeter. That's that's really dense. That's almost as dense as me. Uh, it could work. 6,000 Fahrenheit would be enough. It would be enough. So, you know, you have a, like an aluminum rocket with a very heavy thermal protection system on it, like the shuttle, or you have a stainless steel rocket with a, with a lighter thermal protection system on it. You know, what's the total mass of that? If you just made the entire fuselage out of tungsten, sure. I mean, but I, I honestly think that that's too easy. And if somebody, had, it, it, somebody has probably done some material analysis on this at some point and if this was that easy of a solution, it probably would have been done. If it's it's low hanging fruit, tungsten is too dense. You'd cook anything inside. It really depends, John. It depends on how. It depends on the shape. It depends on the shape of your spacecraft. If you'd cook anything inside, I mean, you could always mitigate it with a with the life support systems, which is also the air conditioner, right? You could do it, but you. I would need to know more uh, in this particular case. Uh, my material, my material understanding here kind of fails me. I'm just reading the Wikipedia page. So, but what do I mean by that? I don't know how tungsten deals with heat flux or metal or, or conductivity. Like we just know it's we know its density and we know its melting point. You know, it really depends, dude. Tungsten is so ridiculously dense that. If you didn't have uniform flow over the vehicle, it would probably heat up other areas. Uh, it would you'd get non-uniform heating on your integral TPS. That would cause that would cause problems because if your thermal protection system doesn't distribute the heat very well and you have it on an integral spaceship, it's part of your structure. Well, guess what? Now you just melted some of the structural integrity on your spacecraft. That doesn't seem very smart. I would be more worried about that than frying what's inside. But once again, I don't know that much about tungsten. I know you can make bullets, out, oh, well, cannon shells out of tungsten. You make sabo rounds, and it it will go through things because it's tungsten. In employed in scale, Aqualux, sure. But I, I also, from what I understand, tungsten is extremely hard to work with, which is why they just make two like arrows basically a, a freaking arrow out of it that's what a sabo round is it's just an arrow that's shot out of a cannon <laughs> read about sabo rounds they're really cool s-a-b-o-t <laughs> it's pretty i mean i know you know that's for everybody else Man, good questions good conversation some of these words are confusing me <laughs> but you still got me. all right tony 
Sweet. If I'm if I'm speaking too much nerd, you let me know. <laughs> I'll try to explain it easier. You gotta let me know though. Because if nobody says anything, I'll just assume you guys understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Tungsten is terrible for re-entry. Titanium alloys are a little better, but still run into problems at those temps. Yeah, Blue Flare, my guess, and this is a huge guess off of what I know about tungsten, is that you wouldn't be able to distribute the heat. That, that tells me that tungsten has awful heat flux, which is probably why they make cannon rounds out of it. Awful heat flux would favor your cannon shell going through things. EJ, when don't you speak too much nerd? When I... When I ask chat if they don't want me to, man. 90% of the time, I have no idea what the crap you're talking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> frick you, frick you, and frick you. Who's next? <laughs> hey, man, you got your wedding band made from, from the stuff. Tungsten. I didn't want it to get scratched. What I didn't expect is that I have a natural... You have a natural glass beaker on your finger. <laughs> Topic change. Are you covering Electron at 315 or just skipping it? I gotta sit this one out, Thomas. In-laws are here, dude. We'll, we'll see. We'll play it by ear, okay? Boron is solid up to 2000 C and fairly light. Yeah, isn't Boron also, like, super reactive, Yannick? Yeah, my man, mine's mine's titanium, titanium, like they use on the space shuttle. The implication there is that the whole space shuttle is made out of titanium, which it's not. Its landing gear is. Its landing gear needs to hold up sixty tons of orbiter. Yeah, that's that's the strong part. Boron. That sounds like a. Hey, what'd you call me? Well then, I then I can I can tell ninety percent of the time I pretty much know what you're talking about. Does that make me a nerdy nerd? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm here to learn, everybody, not to make out with you. Go on with the chlorophyll. No, I will not make out with you. Did you hear that? Chat wants to make out with me in the middle of a stream. I mean, we got. We got Rocket Man up there talking about God knows what all chat's talking about is making make it out with it. I'm here to learn everybody not to make out with you. Go on with the chlorophyll. Yeah, of course, Grabsh. I, I try. I try my best. Oh, an obtainium, yeah. <laughs> Boron is a brittle, boring element. Dude, am I not going to get enough puns doing a cast with Sawyer in an hour or two? Like, am I, are we not going to get enough puns? We just got a pun here too now, huh? Yeah, we just got to do it here. Give me your damn pun tokens. Maybe boron carbide. I'm sure there's a... I mean, Hexa, I'm sure there's people working on different alloys for thermal protection. Met metallic heat shields are definitely a thing that NASA has looked into. We just don't really know what came of it. Have you heard of the line? Yeah, yeah, Vin, I know all about the line. Okay, all right. Yeah, they started to work on it. They started construction. It's... It exists. Add time. Uh, all right, let's roll D20. Tessa retrieved add time. So here's what we do. Every time add time gets retrieved, I roll D20, chat rolls D20. Whoever wins... If I win, no ads. If chat wins, you run ads. Tessa rolled a 19. Have I mentioned that I don't like you, Tessa? Have I mentioned that recently at all? All right. Tell me when they're done. I'm just going to sit here. Don't worry. You won't miss anything. It's just... Did you forget that I use that just to burn points? Yeah, but I really enjoy making you look stupid. Discovery, go Sorry, man. Tim McLaggen, no ads for me. Four-month resub. Nice. 
There was always rhinium, or you could just grow a diamond monocrystal in the shape you need. Oh, uh, yeah, that last part sh sounds really easy. Repost. Just make the whole craft out of hylixes. Sounds rough. Sounds good to me. Obsidian. Hey, have you heard of the, pulled pla the pulse plasma rocket? Yep, yep. Mm hmm Discovery. Aaron 18 month resub. Fist is with the 88. For just 71 payments of a monthly sub, you too can Discovery. understand EJ. Did you see the MIT study of metals under extreme impacts? I have not seen that, Gujar. I'm sure it's good, though. I'm just telling him that so he makes it good. Discovery. Go Red, I lurk, I lurk here just to look smarter. Actually, grab, dude, sometimes, because I get, I get super deep into thought with this stuff, sometimes I go back and watch VODs, and I kind of hear the VOD out of, context, uh, out of context. I'm like, wait, what the hell was I saying? What does that even mean? Then I go back and listen to the whole thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. But if you, like, at face value, I'm like, I don't know what the frick I just said. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I just said. What did it? What just came out of my mouth? Damn, that's a good answer. All right. <laughs> Scientists have discovered that when metal is struck by an object moving at a super high velocity, the heat makes the metal stronger. The finding could lead to new approaches to designing materials for extreme environments, such as shields that protect spacecraft or equipment for high-speed manufacturing. When do we go back to workers and resources? Um, I, I'm planning on doing that soon. Just, yeah, let's, uh, I want to get Fallout 4 out of my system. That should be done, Mutter. Thank you. You guys want to play Fallout for an hour? I don't know how we're going to manage to play it in an hour, but I have to, in an hour, I have to go start to get ready for the Flame Trench, where all your weekly combustion by byproducts end up. Don't worry, you won't have to go anywhere for that. Uh, watch this before Fallout, Uncanny Valley. And I don't want to. I don't like you right now. That link doesn't exist, Nova. Um, what do you think of Shenzhen IO? I don't know what that is, Fijin. That's a game, isn't it? I don't know what it's about, I forget. Uh... <sighs> Classic America approach. Let's shoot it a bunch. It'll make it stronger. Hey, man. Us wanting to blow things up gave us the most bountiful power generation source ever devised by man. All right? Okay. Sometimes wanting to blow stuff up and adding more boosters and more struts is the right thing to do. Sometimes, sh sometimes shooting it is the right thing to do. Just blow it up. All right. Hey, we learned a lot from doing that, okay? Here's the link if you want to read it. That's also 404 in Gujar. Anyway. I said, what's this? GTA 5 next level graphics enhancement with stunning ray tracing showcase on an RTX 4090 Ultra. Why do you want me to look at this? nothing to do with what I'm trying to do. You're just trying to distract me all the time? What's the matter with you? What the, the frick's the matter with you? Discovery, go at throttle up. Yeah. Is that the economic patch, Nova? Good. Good, good. I have not read about that yet. I will do that over the weekend, okay? What is this? from 24 7 gaming gta 5 next level graphics enhancement with stunning ray tracing showcase on rtx 4090 ultra okay gotta admit it's real uncanny valley
Car is too shiny. The specularity on that shader for the car is way too high. And the light diffuse is the, the diffu it's too sharp on that car. Unless that car just freshly got detailed. That looks real nice. That looks really, really pretty. Also, why is it raining in California? I know, recently it's rained more. I get it. Shut up. It was a joke. It was an old joke. It aged kind of well, all right? Jeez. Boom. Yeah, but considering it's GTA V. Dude, I I'm not going to sit here and pretend. Like, Rockstar admitted, right? I remember when GTA V first came out on the PC, everybody complained that cranking the graphics all the way to high... The gra Basically, a lot of the graphic settings in GTA were designed for systems that didn't exist yet. So GTA would age gracefully. Rockstar said that when they released it. They designed the systems here to be able to scale for a couple of gen down the road hardware. So basically GTA 5 was built for a 4090 10 years before 4090 even existed. It's built for this. Rockstar has done that many times. They did that with Red Dead 2. Red Dead 2 as well. Sorry. I was about to say Red Dead 2 2. Eh, whatever. Uh, you would have understood. Shenzhen IO's polybridge, but for logic circuitry and firmware. Cool. Yeah, the specularity on these cars is much too high. You'd get mo more light diffuse on the pain in an overcast condition like this. Trees look great, though. Looks really good. The cars are way too shiny. Like, way too shiny. It's close. It's close, Tessa, but it's not... a. It's not exactly right. Okay. See, look. In these type of overcast conditions, the way the light is being cast, it seems like there's a lot of clouds in the sky. But that mountain looks way too clean. You'd see fog in between the mountains here. There would be overcast conditions. You wouldn't be able to see the top of the mountain in this picture. That's why that looks completely wrong. Look at that mountain. Just kind of sit there and look at it. That looks completely wrong. It looks like it's a sunny day. Also, nice Roadmaster. Repeating texture. See the bricks? Repeating texture. I saw one wall, and then I saw another one that was exactly the same. How do you know it was the same? Was it the same wall? It's a glitch. It's pretty good, man. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. Oh! Not the demon. See, once again, buildings. Those buildings are way too shiny and way too clean for overcast conditions. Let's see. Let's let's see to where it gets sunny. Ah, yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. That looks right. See how it's see how it's kind of foggy? How is it that when the sun's out, it's foggy, but when it's cloudy, it's not? That's weird. Yeah, was that a Series 3? Hold on. Yeah. Defender. Nice. Also, there's some disgusting mid-mapping going on right here. Watch, guys, watch the watch the inner corner of the terrain right here. It looks like it's pulsing. That's because of texture loading and unloading. It's called mitmapping mapping for texture optimization. Watch the right side of the road when he goes around this corner. Watch, right here. Uh, uh, oh, did you see it? The mitmapping mapping though. Oh, man. The ground's pulsing. Uh, 
The lighting, see the lighting in these conditions, that, that is what cruising on PCH at sunset looks like. That's pretty damn close. Yeah, that's, that's pretty damn good, actually. That is a Pacific sunset. The lighting is exact. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it looks like. Nice Thunderbird. The rocks are too flat. Yeah. Yeah, it's because they normal map them. That's why they don't have a lot of topology for opt optimization purposes. It's less geometry to render. It looks like it's bumpy, but it's not. Very nice. Terrain cuts. Yeah, where's the netting that should be over that? You know what I'm talking about. This game makes you miss Los Angeles all, all almost. I don't, and man, I don't need to miss Los Angeles. I, I'll, I'll go to Lompoc, man. It's out in the woods and there's rockets. The Roadmaster. JK. Is the AI driving accurate? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's not enough distortion here. There needs to be more atmospheric haze. Just a little bit. It's close, but it's not exact. It's too clean. 3 out of 10, no CVPI. Yeah, I like you. This is, Thomas, I like you. We're friends. Yep. This is, uh, Tessa linked this. It's um, GTA with uh, ray tracing showcasing like a 4090, what a 4090 can do. It, don't get me wrong. It's pretty. It's not, it's not Uncanny Valley, Tessa, for me. That's because I'm a 3D artist, like by trade. I can see all the problems with this. But it's, see the haze? That makes... That makes that look right. That looks like the Santa Monica Pier. That's pretty damn close. But it seems like in your immediate area, there would still be a little bit of distortion here. Crown Vic Police Interceptor. Guys. Uh, bird. That looks nice. That That is exactly what that looks like. On this road, looking at the Santa Monica Pier. That's, that's really, really nice. It's pretty good, man. Yeah, pretty good. nice all right that's going to conclude space news but don't worry we'll be talking more about space stuff for the flame trench happening in about an hour and uh yeah we'll uh play fallout to uh, tie us over for a second Sorting out massive amounts of massive.